Brad, we got this comment the other day on our YouTube channel, and it said, everybody should be paid for their labor. This is especially true in the film industry. Paying your dues, quote unquote, is a manipulation tactic used to exploit newcomers. Working for free is a good way to commit career suicide. It will get you labeled as an amateur and shunned by unions. Okay. What's your reaction to that? But you know, I, I know people who, who have that opinion. Uh, the dilemma in the film business, as competitive it, as it is, is where is the incentive for an employer in a market that is overcrowded with experienced people to pay an inexperienced person? That's the dilemma. And you know, I, I'm aligned with the ideology of that statement. I think it's a fair concept. Yeah. But practically, you know, this is a business that because of the competition, you know, people are going to do what they have to do to jump ahead. And and a quick way that I know for people to get experience and build up their resume is to, you know, volunteer and work on jobs. And you can certainly do that with your peers and students. You know, but what are you going to learn from them? You know, how much knowledge do they have to pass on? How impressive is that credit going to be? You know, I can only speak for myself, but if I was in that position, and I was when I started out, my first job was a freebie. I worked on a on a passion project for some people in Houston, and you know, they were professional filmmakers. So I would go out on you know the odd days that they were shooting. And I would volunteer, and and but I was learning from very experienced people. I had the opportunity to impress those people, um, and uh, you know, so that some of those people are still friends, and I work with them to this day. Um, likewise, on some of my shoots, with you know, I support my friends. If a friend of mine says I have a little short I want to make, or I want to do a spec project, you know, of course I'm going to come, you know, help you. And I, even if they offer to pay me, I I don't like doing that. I don't like charging my friends for personal projects. If it's a commercial project, you know, by all means, cut me in. Um, and on things like that for crews, I, I typically you know talk to students and mentees of mine, and I say, hey, you want to you want to come out. And the reality is that I've had a lot of people. I've, been, I've done this, you know, twenty or thirty years, and they come out, and and you know, the exceptional ones really bust their butts, and and you know, they learn and they pay attention and they impress everybody. And at the end of the day, people are getting their name and their numbers. And you know, somebody calls me and says, "Do you know a sharp PA we're hiring?" And I'm like, "Yeah, this person did a great job." So practically, I find that, you know. A mechanism that works, and if somebody has a better mechanism, if they have a mechanism by which an inexperienced person can get hired and paid over all the inexperienced people, or all the ex experienced people who are sitting around with nothing to do, waiting for that call, I'd love to hear it. But but to me, that's the dilemma. Right, and I, I, you know, no, no disrespect to whoever left this comment, and I get what they're saying in the sense that, especially if you don't come from a situation where you can take time off and do free work, mm -hmm. not everybody does, mm -hmm. and I can respect that. That's that's a big factor in a lot of this. Um, that you would feel maybe that okay, I'm, I might be being used here if I keep mm -hmm. showing up. At what point should someone say, okay, I've done enough free work, or is there never that point? Well. It's not about doing or not doing free work. It's about doing it strategically. I'm 30 years into my career, and I still do it for my friends, for clients who pay me and say, hey, I have a spec spot, but I don't have any money. Sure, you know, I'm, I support, you know, people. This is a, a business where we scratch each other's back. You know, it's a question of, you know, are you being taken advantage of? Is somebody being predatory? Um, to me, that's, that's the thing that you have to look at. And I would say to somebody who's like, oh, and the other thing I wanted to mention too, because you're saying they can't afford to do a free job. Um, you know, I was having a conversation just the other day with somebody that the film industry is a business. It's a business like any business. Your time is a commodity. And if you have a business, you have to invest in that business. You know, part of that is, you know, Paying union dues, paying for headshots, um, you know, giving your agent ten percent. I mean, you know, the professional organizations, and and some of it is the commodity of your time. You know, if I have an opportunity to work with a director I really want to work with, because um, they're doing a a. a 
film competition and I have nothing else to do. To me, I'm investing in the potential of building a relationship that's going to carry on to paying work. That's my intention. Now, if they keep calling me for freebies, I'm going to be like, well, you know, that, that well has run dry. And for a new person, you ask, when do you stop doing freebies? Well, I would counter by saying, if you're doing nothing but freebies and not getting called for paying work, you need to look at two things. One, are you doing freebies with amateurs and people who have no connections? Or two, are you maybe not doing a good job? Because if you are working with experienced people and you're busting your ass, there's a good chance that you're gonna be getting called for work and you're gonna be getting referrals. There's exceptions to every rule, so you know, but, but I would just say, by and large, what I have seen in my years of mentoring people and also, you know, again, I feel if somebody comes and donates their time on my project, I owe them something. And that something is, if they do a good job, I'm gonna, I'll give them advice, I'll mentor them, I will look out for opportunities for them, I will try and bring them on paying jobs, I will recommend them, you know. But conversely, if they come, come and they show up and they, and they don't bring it and they don't do a good job and they don't pay attention, I mean, I appreciate that they tried, but I can't in good conscience send that person to one of my paying clients because that's gonna reflect on me. That's another thing too, is people always need to remember that if somebody ever recommends you, they're putting their reputation on the line. So it's not just, you know, if you get recommended, you don't show up and do a good job just for yourself. You do a good job for that person who recommended you because if you do a crappy job, the next time that person wants to make a recommendation, the person's gonna say, no, that, that last, last person you sent me wasn't so good. And so somebody you don't even know is gonna miss out on an opportunity because you set a bad precedent. Do you think it's a generational thing? Do you think maybe in the 90s there were less interns or this is always how the film industry's worked? You know, honestly, I think it's it's always how people have worked. There's there's so many stories, you know, probably back into the era of silent films of people sneaking on set and and somebody just mistook them for a crew person and put them to work and and somebody's like, you know, eventually they got paid. Um uh, you know, it's an unorthodox business, and uh, just by, intrinsically, it's an unorthodox business. Now, the perception for people from the outside is that we're all on holiday. You know, I have relatives who think I sit by the pool and drink frozen drinks with, you know, models fanning me every day that I'm not on set, which isn't true. I work harder on those days, you know, networking and hustling. But um, it's a business, and a lot of young people don't get that. They think, oh, I'm an artist, you know, which I get because I consider myself an artist too. But the rude awakening is that there's a lot of business in this. Um, but because it's an unorthodox business, for instance, you know, I could show up on work in, in a t shirt and jeans. You know, you can't wear flip flops because they're unsafe. But, but there's not a quote unquote dress code, although humorously and anecdotally, I'll tell you. There kind of is because no matter where you go in the world, a grip looks like a grip and a director looks like a director. I don't know what it is, man, because I didn't get that memo, but I think it's very funny. Um, but, but you know, it's, it's an unconventional business. And I think creativity and originality and unconventional thinking is, is rewarded and celebrated. You know, just like when Spielberg, you know, went and, and squatted an office on, on the studio back lot. You probably know that story. Um, and, uh, you know, for instance, with resumes, people do resumes. If people ever give me a resume that looks like a corporate resume, I say, man, that's really wrong. And we, we talk about the points. And, you know, one of the fundamental points is that this is a creative business, you know. Get creative. Do an interesting font, a creative layout, some color. Somebody gave me uh, advice once, which I thought was brilliant advice. I was, I was talking to them. I had a meeting and, you know, I was... Uh, talking about, you know, how should I present this thing? And they said, Brad, this is show business. Put on a show. And I, to me, that is like an overarching, defining qualification of almost everything I do, be it a resume or a website or a meeting, you know. And putting on a show involves preparation. It involves, you know, intention. It involves follow through. It involves thinking on your feet while it's happening. Um, 
and I'm diverging a little bit, but the point that I'm getting back to is that is that it's 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 always held its appeal. It's it's always kind of like you know running off to join the circus. Um, I think you know there's a certain kind of people it especially appeals to, and these are you know people who are in in life maybe the outcasts or the artists or the fringe people or you know they think differently, they see the world differently, and that's a valuable asset in this business. And, and again, you know, I had a, 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 one of my mentees once is a script supervisor. And when she was starting out, you know, she got an IMDb Pro account. And she's, um, you know, a very attractive young lady. And she said, I, I'm a little bit averse to put my photo up because, you know, it kind of looks like a model and I don't want to give the wrong impression. And I said to her, this is a business where whatever, whatever advantage you have, you play it, you know? If you, if you qualify for a diversity program, you know, by your gender or your ethnicity, if like me, you've just got years of experience, um, you know, with her, she's an excellent script supervisor and that's fine. But you know what? If somebody hires her because she's got a cute photo on IMDb Pro, you know, I, as long as they don't abuse and harass her, you know, if that pushes her ahead of the competition and gives her the edge, I say, you know, anything that is honest and has integrity, um, you know, you don't want to cheat and be deceptive or abusive to anybody. But whatever your edge is, and everybody has a different edge. I mean, I could have a meeting with a producer and I've done my due diligence and I'm like, they like to ride horses. So I'm going to play that up. I'm going to play, I like horses. I love horses. I've ridden horses. And if that's my advantage, so be it. Um, but anyway, I'm sorry. I, I believe I strayed quite quite a bit from your question. <laughs> no, I love it. I love it. I love when when it sort of is circuitous and yeah. it goes back to our original point. So yeah, probably going back to vaudeville and yeah, the silent you know people, people have been away. volunteering and then hey, you're hired you know. But people ran away from home for that stuff. <laughs> there was no you know there was no expectation of remuneration. It was like you know I'm going to go join the circus. Um, and, you know, some of those people had really hard lives. I mean, some of the people today have hard lives. I've had some hard weeks and months, you know, it's, it goes around. But, um, yeah, it's a business where, you know, again, that whole thing I was talking about in terms of creativity and originality, I mean, that's not necessarily in your visual expressions. That's also in your strategy. You know, again, Spielberg and his office squatting or... Um, you know, uh, I go and I speak to uh, college students and, you know, two or three come up after class and say, I'd like to intern, I'd like to volunteer, you know. Those are the guys who, who get invited. And sorry, what is that Spielberg story? I'm not sure I know that one. Sorry. Well, I, I, I wish I knew it a little bit better, but, but basically um, he was able to get on the lot and he just found an empty office and set up shop. And, and it's, it's, I'm sure the details are really good, but I, I don't have them fresh in my mind. It's a legendary story, but that was kind of how he got his launch before he got his first opportunity, which I believe was a night gallery episode with Joan Crawford. It's the one where she plays a, a blind lady. Um, it's a great episode. I, I wish I could tell you the, the kicker. It's got a little, you know, Twilight Zone-esque uh, twist, but anybody who wants to see it, I'm not going to spoil it for them. Um, but you know, it's just, it's just that out of the box thinking, you know, he thought of it and you know, 300 of his classmates didn't. And whereas he and where are they, you know, and that's just an example. And it, it, it can manifest in so many different ways, just like, you know, just like the students. I mean, one of the things when I'm speaking to classes that I'm always tempted to do, and I kind of don't cause it's a little cruel, but is to tell people, you know, look to your left, look to your right. In five years, those person, those people are not going to be in the business. Not meaning those specific people, but as a generalization, you find that there's tremendous attrition for a variety of reasons, you know. Um, but it's it's you know people just it's you know it's it's a, an industry where staying in the game and pushing forward in and of itself is an advantage. You know, but you just you just always want that that thing, you know, to be able to, you know, what can I do that nobody else is doing? Because if all you're doing is what everybody else is doing, 
then, then you might as well be a penguin in a pack of penguins on an iceberg in Antarctica. You know, you want to be that penguin, you know, with a red bow tie that's jumping up and down and doing funny stunts because all eyes go there, you know. And, and that's even true on set. You know, just like I said, um, I always notice when there's that one PA that, oh, you know, something needs to be swept up, zip. You know, oh, they need help moving something, zip. Can you go wrangle the background, zip. And I'm talking about a real person. There's one person that specifically that that story comes from, you know, but I've seen other people do it. But it's like, you know, that's, you know, Johnny on the spot, person who shows up before anybody else, person who leaves after everybody else. Very simple things, you know, and they have nothing to do with, you know, what you actually may know, whether you can tighten a C stand or, or fill out a, a deal memo. But it's that attitude, it's that mentality. Um, and, and, you know, again, it, that's just a different manifestation of it. Or if you have that resume that's just got that super cute font and it's laid out in a way that I've never seen before, I'm like, wow, I'm going to remember that person. So put on a show. I believe you originally set out to be a director. I wouldn't say I set out to be a director. You know, when I was first interested in making films, um, uh, you know, I spent many years studying fine art. Fine art was my passion, and it still is my passion because to me, this is fine art in a different medium. Um, but when I originally transitioned into thinking I might want to do it, I, as, as a visual artist who is the principal author, I thought, well, I would want to be the auteur, hence the director, and that made sense to me. And so all through college, that was sort of what I was thinking. And then I got out and my first feature film that I worked on, um, I got on set and, you know, I was hustling. I did all kinds of things over the period of time. This is the job I was telling you about where I was volunteering and I was working with professionals. And uh, the first thing they threw at me because, you know, I was a musician. I did a lot of recording, so I knew sound. So they had me be the boom operator. Um, and then the sound guy had days he couldn't show up because, again, we're all volunteering. And, and that's another thing about volunteering. Because of the attrition, you step up pretty quickly. So he trained me how to record sound. So I'm recording sound. And, you know, I learned grip work. And, um, oh, the first AC can't show up. Brad, you want to pull focus? You know, can you run a camera? I mean, I went from being the little guy to, you know, being the guy that, you know, a couple of times it was me and the director in a wind-up Bolex and we were the crew. So, you know, that was, that was kind of the thing. But when I was on that job and I was watching that director, who's a friend to this day, and I you know, really respect this guy, but everybody was hitting on him. Everybody on set wanted a piece of him, you know. Um, you know, understandably, uh, you know, the, the actors wanted his time and the uh, wardrobe people and the producer and the location people. And it's just like, you know, okay. And then over here is the DP. Now this person has the magic box and they get to look through the magic box and make the pretty pictures. They get the lights, the toys. And I'm thinking, now that, that looks like fun. And um, the funny thing to me is, is that was, that, was the, that was the instinct in that moment. Years later, looking at it retroactively, you know, I have a lot of interest in science, just a huge science geek. I love history and I love music and, of course, visual art. And I was reflecting and I realized that all of those disciplines converge in cinematography. You know, you've got the art, obviously. You've got the science in terms of the technology, the physics, um, you know, uh, optics, things like that. You've got history because you understand, you know, the way that, that a film was shot in the 20s versus the 40s. You understand, um, you know, the history of cameras and film grain and digital um, because it all plays in and informs your creative choices. You know, if I want something with a little bit of a retro look, I have to understand that history. Plus, the industry's got a fascinating history. Um, and then as ter in terms of music, I've done a lot of camera operating, and I've come to find that there are rhythms. Even if, you're, even if you aren't aware of it, nobody's tapping out a drum, but in a scene, in my head, I've got a metronome, and I'm like, this person, that person, this person speaks, they grab the glass, and I find there's a rhythm. And to reinforce this, I'll tell you an interesting story about how I cut my montages. Most people find a piece of music, cut to the beats of the music, 
I never do that. To me, it feels artificial. It feels forced. I will cut to the rhythms of the visuals, and then I will find music that fits those. And the thing that is just profound to me time and again is you find the right song and it just drops into place and all those beats hit. Um, and sometimes you maybe there's a little nip or tuck here, you know, sometimes I might cut the music and, and fiddle with it a little bit. But, and sometimes the, the rhythm changes, you know, we're all splicing a different piece of music. But literally all the feature montages on my website were done that way. None of them were cut to music. So, so just the rhythm of it. And so all of those things converging, it just made me realize um, I'm, not a, I'm not a spiritual person, but, but things like that are kind of profound. It's at least magical, you know, when the universe conspires or whatever it is. You know, even though I don't embrace anything, I don't exclude anything. Maybe there is something really cool out there that put me here. Um, but uh, yeah, that was, that was kind of the thing is that... Uh, you know, I, I made that decision. I had that impulse on that first set. And then looking back, I was just overwhelmed by, by all the affirmation of why that had been the right decision. When did you realize that being a filmmaker in Houston, Texas wasn't the place for you at that time? And then what happened when you moved here to Los Angeles? It's a good question. So, so obviously I started my career in the film industry in Houston and I had you know, people I worked with who are mentors and friends, and I still do. I've, I've been back. I've worked there again. Um, I'm a big supporter of Houston and of Texas. Um, I'm an advocate of, of the filmmaking community there, and I want to see it do well. Um, I, I have a lot of mentees there to this day, um, and I support the community. I just actually was invited to uh, become a board member for Southwest Alternative Media Project in Houston, which is a film advocacy and education group that's been around since the 70s. So I'm really honored and I feel that I'm still a part of that community. Um, uh, but uh, what I did realize at the time was, you know, because I, I knew I wanted to be a cinematographer. There wasn't any question. I've always known what I wanted to be. Even when I was a little kid, I knew I wanted to be a garbage man. Now, I didn't stay wanting to be a garbage man. Then I wanted to be an astronaut. But I've never been one of those people who didn't know. So I, you know, even though that has swapped out, and and so I knew at that time, and I and I thought about it, and there were some really good cinematographers in in town, and, and still are, and I thought, you know, in order for me to get a shot, you know, these guys are going to have to retire, or there's going to have to be more work, and it really became evident to me that it was a little bit of a closed ecosystem. It was a small market. Um, and I thought, you know, I realized what a sacrifice it was going to be. I realized in terms of my free time, in terms of, you know, the volunteering I would have to do to, you know, earn my stripes and build my network and learn my skills. Um, just in terms of uh, being a freelancer and not having regular work, um, the uncertainty, you know, all of those things. And I realized, okay, I'm taking a big risk. And that sort of percolated in my brain. And the funny thing is I never made a calculated decision to leave. One day I, I walked home, or I didn't walk home, I drove home and I walked into the house because yeah, I was living with my parents at 25 because huh, why not? You know, I was a filmmaker, they were nice people, I loved them and I was happy to be there. Um, and, you know, for practical reasons, I'm like, you know, I, I have no need for that expense and I'm content. So I stayed there and I, so I walked home. I didn't walk home. I keep saying that I, I drove home and I, I was walking into the house and I, and I just, I had this lark that I was just going to go provoke my parents. I was just going to tell them that I was moving to LA just to get a rise out of them. And, and I figured they would talk me out of it. And, and, uh, so I, I walked in and um, you know there had there had been no prelude to this. It had never been discussed before. And I walked in and I said, "I've decided to move to Los Angeles." And they said, "That's wonderful. We completely support you. We think that's just such a smart decision." And and in that moment, I thought, "Oh shit! I've committed myself. I have to follow through now," um, because again, I you know. But the funny thing is, you know, just like I say, uh, you know, maybe sometimes the universe guides you because maybe it was just like you know I got pushed to where I needed to be in that moment. Because again, it wasn't a conscious thing. Um, but I 
made plans with a camera assistant friend of mine, you know, to, to go out. And I'd already had some friends out here. Um, I had some filmmaker friends and I thought, okay, well, I'll go and I'll cast my lot with those people. You know, none of them were established. They were all, you know, wanting to be filmmakers. And I had this one friend who said, well, I could come crash on her floor. Um, and so, you know, my friend and I made plans and we would leave in a month. And um, started thinking about it and like, why are we waiting a month? And I was like, let's just go. So two weeks in, we left. So we got there and, um, you know, living, living like... Uh, thieves on the on the floor and um this could be a long story but i'm gonna i'm gonna i'm gonna fast forward does so it involve it was, the whiskey a go-go sorry <laughs> <laughs> why do i feel like some of that's coming in yeah. no okay. well we were I, I was in venice it was beautiful my, uh -huh. my friend lived in a townhouse in venice oh, okay <laughs> so but anyway i got there and i had a lot of delusions i really did i thought you know um, um oh and the the other reason that that it made sense to me at the time was that you know instead of making all these sacrifices for this limited market, if I'm going to pay this price, I'm going to go where the sky's the limit. You know, that was the logic that that reinforced that decision. Um, so I get out here and I just, I made so many bad assumptions about how I was going to be welcomed with open arms and get business and get work. And, you know, probably 30,000 other people had that same idea, you know, and so I spent I spent some years kind of aimlessly, and uh, you know, to make a living, I was doing temp work in offices. Um, I was doing the freebies at the time. They had this publication called Drama Log, which is kind of like you know the uh, what Craigslist is today. A lot of it was student films, but I'm like, you know, I'm building a reel. I still I had a few things I'd shot in Houston, but I didn't have much of a reel. So you know, I just needed more footage, and you know, even if I'm working for free, somebody else is paying for the film and the locations and the camera. Um, so I did that for a while, um, and it was really dodgy. And, and, and at one point, I had this epiphany, and I thought, you know, all the people I know are at the same level I am. You know, we, we kind of got into this and said, you know, all for one and one for all, we're all going to be filmmakers. The problem with that is I realized that if I want to make a living at this, I have to work with people who do it for a living, you know? And, and that was a very transformational realization for me. And when I did that, I, that's when I started moving forward. And I started, you know, applying to companies like Concord, New Horizons. One of my really good buddies out here um, worked for them. And uh, he was in the, the marketing department, but, you know, he gave me names and, and pointed me in the right direction. And, and that's just kind of how it got started. And, you know, from there, it took a couple of years. And then I shot some movies for those guys. Um, you know, did some more indies. Um, a young fellow who I mentored in Houston um, ended up blowing up as a huge music video director. And, you know, through a, a, a set of circumstances, we ended up working together and that jumped me up some levels. Um, and then when music videos kind of subsided, I transitioned over, you know, the big budgets kind of went away. I transitioned over to commercials and, um, and then those kind of uh, evaporated and, and now I'm doing narrative again. So probably cut big chunks of that out. <laughs> no, no, I, I love I love the story. So that that's interesting. So you're here in LA and you're you're enjoying time with friends, but you looked around and said, what is going to set me apart from these people? And it was that realization knowing that you were working with other people that this was paying their mortgage. This was yeah. putting their kids in school and knowing that they were going to take it very seriously. I don't know, I'm I'm paraphrasing, but Well, I don't know. I think that the whole set yourself apart realization came a bit later. All I realized was that I was working with wannabes. I was a wannabe. My peers were wannabes, you know, but wannabes, if, you, if it's, it's like, it's like entropy, you know, you're in a vacuum and, and nobody in there has the capacity to advance you unless you get lucky. It's like the lottery, you know, do you, you know, win a festival award? And even then, what does that matter? You know, so, um, this is a business that it's very important to remember. You will get hired to do what you show you can do. So if all you do is freebie low budget stuff, that's what 
you're going to get brought on for. If all you do is volunteer stuff, you know, that may be what you get stuck in. If all you do is commercials, it's going to be hard to get a feature film. And even if you do commercials like me and you got a broad variety of stuff, if somebody wants a car commercial, well, they want the car person. They want the one with, you know, 10, 10 car spots or, you know, the beauty person. I can do all of those things, you know, and I have and I can show them, but I don't have the preponderance. And, and so that was the thing that, that, you know, just going back to my early, my first experience with that phenomenon was that I was working with, with wannabes. People I liked, people who were talented, but nobody who was in a position to jump me up to a salaried position. And I had to break outside of that paradigm, you know, just end the entropy, go to a, a completely different model. And that model was to find the people who were getting paid to do the work and work with them. And that was really probably one of my very first significant realizations of, of, you know, learning the dynamics in this industry. And we basically are all wannabes when we start out at something. So I'm still really a wannabe. wannabe. <laughs> <laughs> you know, there's still things I want to do. I, I don't say that that term maliciously at all. It's just, you know, we were powerless. We had no connections and nobody was giving us money. So, you know, it's not a judgment. It's just that was the fact. Do you think if you were still moving to Los Angeles today that it would take you five to 10 years to find steady work as a cinematographer? It's hard to say, but I'm gonna go out on a limb and say probably not. The reasons being are that there are tools today that didn't exist in 1990. You have the internet, you have film industry groups and uh, associations, you have um, uh, you know, access. Like when I started shooting, the only way to shoot quality work was film cameras, which were very expensive and very hard to come by. And the film was expensive and the processing and trend and the telecine. Um, and if you shot on video, it, it looked cheap and crappy, but even those cameras were expensive. There were no inexpensive home camcorders. Um, and so it's, you know, I could shoot something on my iPhone and you could cut it into an Avengers movie and you would never know. That That is just an incredible paradigm shift. You know, you can cut films on your phone, you can cut them on your computer. You know, those things did not exist. Um, you know, now you've got um, YouTube and influencers and web shows uh, and, um, you know, so many more things. Now, how long it would take me to crack in, you know, to the more professional stuff like, you know, feature films, uh, it's hard to say, but it would be a lot easier to make quality content. It would be a lot easier to access other filmmakers. You know, I mean, back in the 90s, you know, how, how do you find anybody? You know, I mean, now you just pop on Facebook and you jump in a group and boom, there you go. You're surrounded by them. You know, and if that if that group is full of a bunch of shitty people with bad attitudes, you just go to the next group and go to multiple groups. Um, yeah, I, it's a very different world. So I think I think maybe not. I think I think it would have I think it would have happened faster. Uh, you know, whether the big stuff would have happened faster or not, I don't know. But I would have been up and running making films faster, almost for sure. And just as a side note, you said you were crashing on a friend's couch or floor. I was on a floor on a little foam egg crate. <laughs> you know, the little mattress toppers. And not only that, but I slept. I continued to sleep on that for about a year, even when I got my own place. I had a, I had a one bedroom in, um, at uh, Vermont and the 101 in Koreatown. And, and, and it was literally as a one bedroom and... It was three of us and at times more because, you know, we were kind of the underground railroad for Houston. When people would come out, I'd be like, come on out. And I and I paid forward my friend's offer where she said, um, you know, you can come out and stay for free for a month. And that was kind of my policy is you can come out, you stay for free for a month, give you time to, you know, find a job and a place and and, you know, get, you know, get in a place where where you, you're comfortable and secure. And uh, I think, you know, we helped some people, you know, get their starts that way. I'm very proud of that. What's the strangest uh, part-time job you had un unrelated to film during that time? During that time? I, 
probably, there was some job that I only vaguely remember, but this guy would pay me to go and audio tape like school plays or musicals on a little cassette recorder. In retrospect, I'm just like, what was that all about? I don't even really remember it, but but it, it happened. So yeah, that was the strangest thing, really. Interesting. Where'd you find that job? <laughs> I don't even remember oh, okay. much about the job. <laughs> I have no idea where okay. I found that. What did Roger Corman teach you about the business of filmmaking? Well, Roger Corman personally and directly taught me nothing because I didn't work. I never worked with Roger. Um, I met Roger, and he's a really nice guy, and he's like a big kid. He was so excited about this cheesy monster that somebody had repurposed, you know, very affordably. I think he was more excited that, you know, they had repurposed it for next to nothing than, you know, what they had actually produced with it. Um, but, you know, he had a very, I'm sure he still does have a very, uh, um, sparkly and wonderful personality and this deep mellifluous voice that you could just, you know, keep talking, Roger, that sounds great. Um, but in terms of the precedent that he set at the studio he ran, New Concord New Horizons, um, it definitely taught me a lot of things because, you know, it was, it was, you know, it was called colloquially Concord School of Film or Roger Corman School of Film. And, um, and it really was. A lot of people got their starts there. You know, you go, they weren't always Concord because he had New World and some other other things. But he gave his, he gave starts to people like, you know, Ron Howard got his first directing opportunity. Um, you know, Dennis Hopper worked for him. Uh, Gail Ann Hur, Jim Cameron. I mean, these are, they're all way before me, of course. But, you know, they're in, in that, in that, in that realm of, of, uh, of Roger Corman. And, you know, there wasn't a lot of, of money. He, he has this book that's titled How I Made, you know, 200 Movies. I forget the number. 200 Movies Never Lost a Dime. Um, you know, he would do things like, uh, you know, get Martin Sheen and, you know, he'd be on the cover of, a, of, a, of the, the video box. And then you realize what actually happened is that Roger paid him for one day and they shot little scenes that they cut in through the movie. You know, that's smart. You know, people buy a movie because Martin Sheen's on the cover. Well, there you go. Um, so, you know, I learned things like that. Um, I um, I remember that, uh, and this wasn't me. This was my friend who worked in marketing. He, they would send him out with a clipboard into malls, and they would just have these titles of non-existent films. And he would ask people, you know, which, which movie would you go see? Which is interesting because that's how Sharknado originated. They had the title. They didn't even have... The, uh, the the script and I know the fellow who wrote that and he said they when they decided to make it they conceived it as a straightforward you know serious movie and he said he said no that's this is a, this is something we've got to have fun with and and somehow he got them to trust him and it became what it became but you know again things like that you know things like you know what really sells a movie, you know? Is it the fact that I take great pictures or this person does great acting? I mean, you know, I think that's what brings a movie home, you know, but what gets the butt in the seat is the title or the fact that Martin Sheen's in it. Um, from a practical point of view, I remember meeting the uh, producer at the studio on my first job and he said, took me into his office and he said, Brad, every day you can pick one scene to make look really good. Beyond that, just make your day. And, you know, being a very proud artist, you know, I'm like, okay, I've got to game the system. How do I make them all look really good? And, and so I was coloring outside the lines. I mean, what's the, you know, what can I do, you know, that, that's, you know, outside of the normal parameters? And one of the things I came up with was that I would show up to set every day an hour or two early. And I would do diagrams. I would go and I would be in the set without blocking or anything, but I'd have a sense, you know, of what it was. I, I probably had gone with the director and talked talked through it. I don't remember that, but I probably did. Um, but anyway, I went in there and I would place some lights. I would, on my diagram, I would be like, you know, this is the lighting scheme in here and that's the lighting scheme in there. And I would go through all the sets because they were, you know, it was sets on a soundstage. And then when the crew would get there, 
um, you know, I would walk them through the sets and the first set we would, we would get it lit. And then after that, if I didn't have time, I would just hand them the diagram. I'd say, here, go set this up. So I was micromanaging them and I would have them light two and three sets ahead. Now, the limitation with that is you have to have the equipment, but this was a studio, the equipment was laying around. And this is something that I've always incorporated. You know, anytime that I, that I am able to, you know, I sell that to people as I will move faster if you give me the equipment to pre-light so I'm not going into a room and starting at square one, that you're walking in and it's roughed in, we just have to tweak and shoot. So, you know, that was one of the advantages. And part of that reason was because Literally, to my astonishment, I would I, when we were shooting, I would walk into the bathroom and I would no sooner have stopped and gotten ready to do my business than the door would open and a PA would be saying, "We want you on set." You know, I mean, I just had no time. So I had how do you how do you hedge that bet? And that was you know one of the things I did. Um, another thing that I did because we often didn't have the thing we needed. Um, you have to think out of the box. How can I do this differently? If I don't have Dolly Track, if I don't have that light, if I don't have the Kukuloris, if I don't have the thing I need to do the thing, how do I make it work? So it got me thinking really creatively. And sometimes you completely reconceive a shot, you know? And, and sometimes that challenge makes that shot even better, you know? And... Um, so, so that's just, you know, that's a, a, just a really a revelation, but also it got me into the habit of where, you know, if I needed something to break up light and I didn't have it, um, you know, or whatever I needed, I would just go walk around the studio, which was an old lumber yard, and I would look in trash cans and in corners, and I would find these little treasures. I'm like, I can use this. And it's funny because years later, I was working on Torque for Warner Brothers, which is a $55 million action movie. I was shooting second unit. And uh, I had a, Martin Henderson was the lead actor and I had a scene with him and the light was too clean on his face. I wanted to break it up. And I had these, you know, really experienced veteran grips and I had this huge 10 ton grip truck outside and they're like, what about this? What about this? What about this? And I'm like, no, 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 none of those things are right. And, and so I, I walked around, I just walked around and I found this old raggedy plastic C47 bag, you know, clothespin bag. And I was looking, I was like, you know what this is? And I, and I walked up and we had a Leco on his face and I put it in there. It was just perfect, you know, very subtle, but it, it, it took the edge off the light. And I'm like, this is it. And these guys are looking at me like I'm crazy. And, you know, they bring a C-stand and they clamp it. And they thought it was so funny. They found a spare Pelican case and they, you know, they called it the XZ47 or whatever. And that was, now that was on the truck. But, but, you know, it's, it's, you know, it's, it's easy to take the thing off the shelf and to use it, you know? I mean, anybody can do that. But um, I, I really am very happy that I got pushed into that position of learning to MacGyver, learning to appropriate, you know, what was handy. I was on a shoot just the other day and uh, uh, we were shooting a, a, an interview with somebody and in the background there was this white pole and you know everybody's freaking out. We don't want to see it. Can you go with a different angle? And you know there was angles which showed sliding glass doors, or the light was bad on the actor's face. And I just took some two-inch black gaff tape and literally just put it on the face of the pole towards the camera. Um, another one of my favorite stories is I did this video with um, Rob Thomas called uh, "Lonely No More," and. Uh, there was a scene with him in close up and he's got these shiny glasses on and I wanted a reflection in the glasses. And we did not have a, because they're convex, you know, they show a pretty, you know, wide degree of range. I didn't have anything white, wide enough that you didn't see the end of it. And in a moment I said, you know what? Get me some a roll of paper towels and a C-stand. And I took that roll of paper towels and put it on the C-stand. I just went whoosh. I raised the C-stand up and if you see that video, if you go to my website and you'll see this, the thumbnail for it, it has this white line, it's toilet, it's a paper towels. So I could give you so many more examples of that, but those are the kind of things, you know, when you don't have the stuff, when you don't have the thing, when you're shooting low budget, you know, when you're challenged, when you don't have the time, 
you know, don't, don't, don't think of it as a handicap, embrace it as a challenge because really it will make you a better filmmaker. And, and sometimes maybe more often than not, what you come up with will be even better than if you'd had the thing to pull off the shelf. And when you do have free time, do you go to swap meets or thrift stores and look for things where you, cause it sounds like you just have this keen eye for like intuitively, you know, what's going to work. I, I don't. I mean, for me, it's, it's an in the moment kind of thing. I mean, if I, if I saw something like, um, you know, every once in a while I've bought, you know, little lights and little tchotchkes, but I don't, um, I don't, I don't go looking for it. I, I do try to balance my time, you know, and not be in work mode all the time. Although I am a little bit of a workaholic when it comes to, you know, both networking and also mentoring. I probably push myself a little more than, than I ought to. I've got to, you know, find that balance again with personal time. But, but, um, yeah, it's, uh, I've had a few dreams in my, in my life where, you know, I would, I would wait, you know, I would be dreaming that I was on a set and I, and a light was broken or missing and I would just get so worried about, you know, how do we fix it and how do we, and then I wake up and I'm like, I have to have this conversation with myself that it was a dream because I'm so upset and so involved, you know, or those dreams where you dream that you're on set and then you wake up and it's time to go to set, you know, it's, you know, so I try and, I try and, you know, I try and not be on the clock 24-7. After a number of years of shooting low-budget indies, you left that world to begin shooting uh, music videos. Uh, why was that the right decision for you at that time? You know, a door opened, and it was a terrific opportunity to work with a really talented director who was also a friend, you know? And um, and I one thing I love about this business is it's always something new, you know? I'm not, even if I'm just doing features, you know, one's a sci-fi and one's a horror and one's a romantic comedy, you know, and, and as much as I love the people I work with, you know, I work with different people all the time and I love them all equally, you know, so it's, there's just this variety um, and, you know, to be able to explore high-end music videos was just irresistible and, and I, I loved it and I'm very grateful I had that opportunity. It really, you know, shifted the, shifted the, the dynamic for me. But then at some point you stopped doing music videos. Can you talk about what happened? I haven't really ever stopped doing music videos. I mean, what happened is that the music video industry changed. Um, from my point of view, it was precipitated initially by, by Napster. Um, you know, people illegally downloading videos um, and then everything that followed, um, you know, all the way to today where you've got streaming where you know, apparently the revenue to the artists and the labels is, you know, nothing compared to what it used to be. Um, but anyway, because of that, that, that shift in, in the f financial aspects of that industry, people started dialing back on the, the size of the budgets, the number of the videos. Um, you know, even at the time, I wondered how much of this is, is real because they don't have the beans to count to make it happen. And how much of it is opportunistic where somebody's taking advantage of this, you know, to just slash costs and, you know, knock us all down. Right before that happened, they had finally, you know, a lot of the production companies had finally signed, um, become signatory with IATSE, which, you know, you could look at it and say, wow, you know, that's kind of a weird thing that, you know, right after that happened, we suddenly had this, you know, this, this crisis with funding them. But, uh, but I don't know, I'm not a conspiracy guy. And, and frankly, I'm an optimist and I, I tend to assume the best in people until proven otherwise. So at least in my brain, it's just, that's the way the cookie crumbled. And, and I still do music videos. It's just, they don't have the budgets. They don't have, you know, as high a profile. They're, they're super fun. You know, I love them. Um, and same with commercials. I mean, I, there was a time when I just made a fortune shooting commercials and sure there's still big commercials out there and every once in a while I get one um, but I it just seems like again that the, that the model for that market changed significantly and and either by virtue of the realities or opportunism or a combination of both it's it's changed and 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 one thing that I tell young people about this business you know there's not many things in this business that are a constant 
But one of the things that is a constant is change. You know, whether it's the dynamic in the markets, whether it's the prevalence of one genre over another, whether it's a certain style of cinematography, whether it's, a, you know, film cameras or digital cameras or HD or 4K or 8K, you know, it's always going to change. So hopefully you enjoy that. I do. Can you compare and contrast where you were creatively, emotionally, when you were working on these low budget indies to when you went to these higher budget music videos with name talent? How was that? Um, it's interesting because, because on a certain level, artistically, I was ready for sure. But in terms of confidence and knowledge of the politics and dynamics, it was, it was a learning curve. And I remember calling one of my mentors, uh, Stephen Poster, and I asked him, because I had this one, I had this uh, Mariah Carey music video, and we were shooting this intersection downtown, and we had this car explosion. It was this huge A-list movie kind of lighting setup. And I said, you know, I'm a little bit nervous because, you know, I've, I've lit stuff before. I've lit movies and I've, I've lit some big music videos. But, you know, they were all, you know, houses or, or um, you know, offices or stages or, um, uh, you know, cars. Just things that, um, you know, never an entire bloody city street. And I'm just, you know, I was, I was a little anxious. And he says, you know, Brad, the thing to think about is that Everything you know about lighting still applies. It's just a different scale, you know. I mean, a backlight is a backlight, and a, and a side light is a side light, and and I and and he really made a lot of sense. And I'm sure he was much more thorough than that. But those are the broad strokes I remember. And the other thing he said is, you know, make sure you have a really good gaffer, and that's true. And I had an excellent gaffer, so so it all came together, and it was fine. And that underscores something, and I, it wasn't that moment that I realized it, but it, that was one of the moments that reinforced it, was to always have a great crew, you know, have a great team behind you. It's interesting to me that there are some people in this business who feel they have to be the smartest person in the room, uh, or they're intimidated. And I'm just, I'm the opposite. I'm like, you know, I want people who know more about their job and their responsibility than I do. It's important that I know a little bit about it so I know what I'm asking of them and how long it'll take and what it'll cost. Um, you know, but but all the little bits and pieces, you know, I really want somebody who has much more experience. And one of the things I like to say to people about the crews that I bring on is that if, if we're on set and I fall over dead, you'll still make your day on time and on budget because that's just how good these people are. Is that real, a real thing, though, that some would hire down, so to speak, because they feel that they would be I think challenged? So I think so. I I don't know where they would actually hire it, but I know I know people who are resentful and they want to feel like they know it all. You know, it's uh, it's just a phenomenon. It's so then, if someone is on a set like that and they know that's the person I'm working with, uh, how do I stay small for the day? So that I, I don't, don't ruffle I don't, feathers. I don't think it's a matter of staying small. I think it's just a matter of, you know, doing your job and just not challenging that, you know. I mean, if they say, you know, that that this is their idea, you just nod your head and be like, okay, sure, you know. Um, I mean, there are people who would have a pride and want to stand up for themselves. And if there's a strategic reason for that, okay, maybe. But if there's no strategic reason, then I'm a big believer and, and it really doesn't matter who's right. You know, it's that's a, a horrible thing for me to have to fight for. I, I would much rather do the thing right and get the thing right. And if, if somebody else has to take credit for it, you know, so be it. And if, and if they do it a lot and I really hate it, then why just stop working with that person? You know, but but confronting them and challenging them, I'm just not sure there's any value in doing something like that. So the best is just nod and and do as they ask. And then if at the end of the shoot you realize this might not be something I want to continue with, that's one thing. But just to save, just for conflict's sake. Well, unless there's a, a, a strategic reason not to, safety would be a good reason not to. Um, 
you know, there may be a strategic reason. There may be a dynamic or a relationship I'm not taking into account in somebody else's circumstances. But just for me, in my experiences, I've never had a reason to not do that. I, I've never had a reason where I thought, okay, you know, there's going to be value in pushing back on this. You know, it's it's to me, it's always like, you know, let's get the job done. Let's let's do it right. Let's, you know, make the client happy. You know, let's get paid. Let's go home and, and work another day. Brad, how did life change for you when the high-end music video market crashed? How scary was this? I was very distracted when that happened because I was in a relationship that was ending after like 13 years. And uh, it was contentious circumstances from my point of view. Uh, and I felt a, a lot of betrayal in terms of, you know, trusting people I probably should not have trusted. Um, and, and it affected a lot of things for me. And so I was kind of in survival mode. Um, and, and I don't know that I was as engaged with that aspect of my job at the time. I mean, I was certainly still working and very happily I dovetailed into, you know, doing a lot of commercials and promos. So, so my income really didn't take a hit, which was really an act of grace because I was not in a, an emotional place to deal with, you know, yet another monkey wrench. Um, you know, but life's like that. You know, we, we, we do our jobs and we have that, our career reality, and then we have our personal reality, whether it's, um, you know, happy things like people having kids or sad things like people breaking up and parents dying. Um, you know, that's life and everybody, everybody has that. Um, but, you know, I have always landed on my feet. I really have. And, and, and I am very grateful um, that I've always been able to pivot. You know, I've got a broad set of skills and part of that's intentional. There are people who, you know, have the theory that you should specialize, you know, again, like those people who do the car commercials or the beauty commercials. Um, you know, back for a while, that, that kind of green-blue cinematography look was a thing. And I intentionally didn't do a lot of that because if you're the guy who does that, when the day comes that it's passe, so are you. Um, and then, like I had told you earlier, you tend to get hired to do what you show you can do. So I deliberately, intentionally created a body of work that is diverse and represents the genres and types of things I like to do. And if you look at my website, which is only at the tip of the iceberg, all my work is on Vimeo, you know, uh, password protected, so I can show it if I need to. But, but the work that's on my website is honestly that I want to do more of that kind of work, you know, it's intentional. Um, so, you know, again, I, I was very happy and fortunate to land on my feet. Um, you know, just like the Beatles say, with a little help from my friends, which is very true, um, and uh, did some really wonderful work. I, it was just a new phase of life for me in a, in a lot of ways, but it, it became a very happy and rewarding phase. I mean, some of the best work I feel I did was during that period. You know, I feel that uh, I don't want to be perceived as perfect. I don't want to be perceived as, as not having problems. I, I mentor a lot of young people. And, and I think it's important for them to understand that I'm human and that I'm vulnerable and that I have setbacks and challenges because I don't want them to look at my career as an example and say, you know, oh, wow, I want that. But but, you know, that guy's invincible. You know, I want them when they look at themselves and say, you know, I'm I'm unsure or I'm hurting or I don't have the money or, you know, whatever their liability is, I want them to look at me and say, well, you know, he overcame something so I can too. That's the kind of example I want to be. So I'm very happy airing my dirty laundry. Do you think there's a lot of pressure in this industry to, to appear as if one's life is perfect until unfortunately some cracks come out and if someone's on a certain level, now it's in horrible tabloids and yeah. everybody can take their stance on Twitter and... Yeah, I, I know for a fact there is. I mean, you know, again, this is a, a an image-driven industry. And again, it, this goes back to that whole thing about it's show business put on a show. I'm very intentional about what dirty laundry I air. But, you know, just like just like you don't post on Facebook and, and say you woke up with a sick stomach and and, um, you know, you're mad at your boss. I, you know, maybe some people do some of the time, but you, you know, 
you're judicious about that kind of thing, you know? And, and, it, and it is a business where we all want to be perceived as working and in demand. But I don't think the reality for most of us is that we always are. You know, I mean, I think the reality for us all is that we have ups and downs and we have really good runs and then we have some frustrating slow periods and I'm sympathetic to that for everybody. And I'm very grateful when I have when I have a, a, a run and I'm not resentful if I'm slow and other people are working. I'm glad they're having their moment. Um, you know, but I think there are people and, and I understand it, you know, that you give that impression um, for, for whatever reason. When you're busy, you tend to get more calls and work. So you you put on the impression of 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 being busy, and it's quite easy because you know um, as long as you have stuff and you're sharing, you know. And again, this is something that didn't exist in the '90s when I first came out here. But you know, you you're your own publicity machine, and you're like, oh, you know, festival award and and oh, interview and and this movie's coming out on Netflix. It makes you look really busy. You might not have worked for six months. They don't know that. I mean, you know, you don't shoot a movie and it comes out the next day. So, but you just, you manage that. You manage that impression. And I do, I do. I mean, I honestly do. Um, you know, I don't want to, I don't want to, I never want to seem, even, even if I'm, even if I'm, you know, being candid about my vulnerability or my setbacks, you know, I never want it to be a complaint or an excuse because I don't think it should be. I mean, I think, you know, t the only reason I do it is I just want to humanize myself for anybody who might be looking at me as an example, because I don't, I always want them to feel that, that the things I say and the things they may see that I've achieved, I want them to feel that that's accessible for them too. How do you keep faith in yourself and in your craft during turbulent times? Boy, is that a good question. Talk about dirty laundry. Um, you know, there was, I have this terrific career coach and her name is Erica Wernick. She's really fabulous. Highly, you should do an interview with her. You really should. She's just got a book coming out. Oh, nice. I'll send you her information. Okay, but, please. But, you know, she would probably, you know, punch me in the arm for saying this, but there was a time in my career uh, early on in the 90s where I was so frustrated and, and so down and didn't believe in myself. And I just had this revelation. I was like, you know what? I've set a goal, and I don't have to believe in myself. I just have to do the steps that I committed to doing to get me through the valley of the shadow of death. And, and that worked for me. I mean, it was a device that worked for me. And, and I feel like occasionally I still have it. I mean, I think a lot of people, you know, like Erica, talk about how important it is you know, to believe in yourself and to believe that your success is inevitable. And that's also very powerful. Um, I just find that that my brain is a little more complex in terms of the things it does to me. <laughs> you know, I don't know that I'm always in the driver's seat. And uh, quite honestly, I, I, I deal with self-esteem issues. I really do. I mean, I think a lot of people do in this business. You know, your identity is tied up in your work even if you don't want it to be, because you put so much of yourself into it. And if it doesn't do well, or even if it does well, I mean, honestly, the irony to me of having something successful and praised and then not having a lot of work, that's even worse than having something criticized. Because, because at least if they criticize it, you're like, okay, it sucked, I get it. But if they say it's awesome and then the jobs don't follow, you're like, you know, where's where's the karma? Where's the payoff? Uh, you know, we made a deal. <laughs> so so that's harder for me. Um, but uh, um, I do try to keep faith in myself. And 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 you know, honestly, when when I when I do have crises with the system or success as a nebulous thing. I, I really, I get basic and I go back and I remind myself, you know, Brad, you're an artist. That was the contract you made. You never said you wanted to be rich. I don't care about being rich. I would like to be self-sufficient. I'd like to be secure, you know. And if I was rich, it'd be okay, but I'd be donating and helping. And I mean, I'm just, I'm, I just don't need a super yacht and, a, and an island. Um, but, you know, I remind myself that the contract that I made was that I wanted to be an artist. Simple as that. And you know what? I, I am. I mean, I just, I look at 
the work I've done, I work at the, the work I'm doing, and even if these people don't like it, or those people don't like it, or even if everybody likes it and I don't get a job or an award, it's like, you know what? You gotta do the work. You know, somebody gave you the toys, somebody gave you the sandbox, and they let you build your sandcastle. And, and that's enough. Do you think a lot of success is luck or success can be orchestrated? I want to believe it can be orchestrated, you know, and I know, uh, you know, people who, who feel very strongly about that. And, and I feel, I feel it can be influenced, you know. I don't know if I believe it can be orchestrated in a guaranteed way because, because for, for, for a hundred people doing a hundred things more or less the same, they're going to have different outcomes, you know, because they'll know different people, they'll be at different moments in time, it'll be a different project, um, you know, they may have a different mode to their personality or their energy or, you know, I don't know. I mean, it could be simple, simple things. You know, I give you an example. I mean, I have people who message me out of the blue. And if people message me and they have a specific question and they say, Brad, what light did you use in that particular scene? Or they say, um, you know, would you look at my resume? I respond to them, you know. People who, who hit me up and they say, how are you doing? I, I just don't even answer because I, how do I, I don't, I don't need any small talk and how do I answer that? You know, it's like, so, so, so the point being is that, is that um, you know, the way you interact with the world, be it me or be it those person, persons emailing me, you're going to get a different response depending, depending on what you put out there. And I've forgotten your question, but I hope I answered it. <laughs> oh, you did. You did. I think you said it did. Because I was saying, is it success? Do you think a lot of it's luck? Or it can be orchestrated, yeah. and so it sounds like it might be sort of a combination. Uh, it's it's got to be. Mm -hmm. It really has to be because because you know it's it's what is it they say success is is preparation meeting opportunity, right? You know you have to be prepared. You know if you go into that meeting, if you luck out and you get that meeting, but you you don't know squat, you're not going to impress them. But if you are a genius and you're an introvert and won't go out and do the meetings, then you're still stuck. And just for anybody who's an introvert, I am a terrible introvert. I am so shy. But I want this more than I want to be shy. So I just, you know, I'm not an actor, but in that way I am an actor. You know, I will, I will go do the act. And I'm not always good. You know, if I'm in a crowd and I don't know anybody and I don't have a wingman, that's kryptonite. I shut down and I sit in a corner. I, to this day, I'm ashamed of it, but I just, I'm, I'm just I, uh, powerless. But, you know, I know to have a wingman. I don't have somebody else to help me, you know, or at least find, oh, I know that person. They can introduce me, you know. I mean, that's, you know, um, but, you know, when I was a little kid, I, um, you know, I would just, my mom would say, you know, you want to, you want a Slurpee and, and she would, you know, I'd be sitting in the car and, and, and she said, well, you have to go in and get it. I would just sit there and cry because I didn't want to go in by myself. I was so shy. Um, but so it was it's hard, you know. But, uh, you know, you just, if you want something enough, then you do the things you need to do. One of my favorite sayings right now, and because I'm looking to level up. I mean, look, I could be at the top and I'd still be looking to level up. But there's this great saying, and it's, if you want something you've never had before, you have to do something you've never done before. And sometimes that might be obvious, but sometimes it's surprising. Like, just the other day I had this realization, because I'm a workaholic and I drive myself like crazy. I was reading Erica's book, as a matter of fact, meant for this, go out and buy it. It's a really good book. Um, but I had a thought that was really kind of a non sequitur. It wasn't really relevant to what I was reading, but I thought, I thought, Brad, you need quiet time. You need to stop and just be quiet, whether you meditate or, or just watch the world go by, because you don't do that. And that's surprising because my logical brain says, well, that's not going to get you anywhere. But then I start thinking, you know, because I know that, that you just can't go 24 hours, even though I have, because you wear down, you, you lose your acuity. 
So, so you know, maybe that is the thing. Maybe I need more breaks and more quiet time because maybe that will make the time I do spend working just that more focused and that more effective, you know. Um, you know, it's better to to spend five really effective minutes than than an hour kind of unfocused and tired and distracted. So so that was the thing that I thought, well, you know, that's interesting because that's a thing I haven't done before. And it's it's not what I would have guessed. You know, but that's that's just kind of the thing, is is that um um you know, and, and the other thing about success is people, when people ask advice for about success or about being a cinematographer or being on set or meeting people or networking, everybody wants the formula. They want the roadmap. They want the A, B, C equals D. And I get that because as humans, I think we're wired that way. I want that, but guess what? I've never found it. Um, it's, just, it's just always different. It's a moving target. And, and you learn as you go and you, you take your best guess and you try it. And if it doesn't work, then you're like, okay, it's not working. I'm not going to quit, but let me try something different. Let me revise it. Can I go this way? Can I go that way? Can I show up with flowers and chocolate? Can I, you know, get my buddy to do an introduction? You know, whatever, you know, uh, it's not about stopping. It's about, it's about, okay, this isn't working. Let's think of something else. Let's reinvent. And even something that does work for a while, just like the market changes, just like the technology changes, it's like, you know what? It used to work, it's not working now. Try something different. So being internal and introvert, maybe needing quiet time, did that work for you growing up in Houston? And how did you turn that, like if you needed to turn on that, and I'm just, I'm just stereotyping here, the Southern charm and being sort of, you know, larger than life, which you do have that side to you, I can see it, but how, do, how would you manifest that if you had to walk into a room and sort of own it? If I know people, it's easy, you know. If I know some people, it's easy. Um, but part of it is having generosity towards the other person. Um, I think that um, one of the things that I tell young people is, is if you approach a relationship, if you want a meeting or you want to connect with somebody, do not approach it from what can they do for me. I am going to ask them for a job. I am going to ask them to give me something. The best way to approach it is to be like, what can I give them? You know, what do I have to offer? And, and um, you don't have to be an experienced filmmaker. We are blessed with social media where we can see that this person likes going out on a boat, this person likes dogs, and that person likes to paint. And this person maybe went to your school, and this person maybe is friends with your uncle. I don't know. But we have the ability to do due diligence on people in a way that has just never been possible before. I do that and I recommend that people do that, you know, and you go and you you do your homework and then they're not a stranger, you know, because you have, you find that thing, oh, you know, they like comic books or, oh, they like th this, my, their favorite movie is my favorite movie or, or they like the same band I like. That takes a lot of the, the edge off of, because the part of the fear is like, I don't know what to say. But you know, if you guys both like Doberman Pinchers, now you have something to talk about. And, and it's lovely for the other person because you know what, all day long, they're getting calls. Oh, give me a job. You know, I want to be a PA. Will you make my movie? Blah, 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 blah. And they're like, oh, you want to talk about my dog? Oh, here's a picture of my dog. They're so happy, you know? And that's, that's the thing because you have to remember, this is a business of relationships. It's not a business of, of like parasites and, 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 and pray, you know, it's, it's, it's your friends. You want, you want to work with your friends. You're going to call your friends. You're going to work with your friends. Everybody likes hanging out with their friends, you know, and this is a business where you have the ability to hire the people you like, you know, and, 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 you know, people who are, it's just like in your life. Think about, you know, that one friend who always asks you for something. They always want you to come over to their house and do them a favor and, and, and buy lunch and they never reciprocate. 
How, how excited are you to spend time with that person, you know? But think about the other person who calls you up and says, oh, there's this new movie and you would love it. You know, that's the person you're happy to hear from. So, you know, when I meet with people, I try to be able to offer that. And also when I follow up and in social media, I'm like, oh, hey, here's an article. I know you like butterflies. Here's a butterfly article. Um, and, and it's not just... Um, you know, a cynical thing because because I think it's cool that they like butterflies. I think it's neat, so that's cool. Um, so when I'm in a in a position of meeting people, one of the things that that mindset precipitates is that it makes you listen because you don't know what people want if you don't listen to them. And a lot of people will tell you that in meetings you don't want to do a lot of talking. You want to listen, um, and then talk strategically and and to the point. And so I think if you listen, you know, people are going to tell you uh, their story and they're going to tell you what they need. And I've had that many times where they're like, oh, and I was on this shoot and there was this thing. And I'm like, oh yeah, well, you know, the next time you have that happen, let me know because I know a guy, you know, or, oh, well, let me tell you what I did once in a similar situation. Um, and, and I think that's, you know, again, you're being friends. And I literally years ago, stopped leading with my website. Like the most aggressive thing I'll do now is put it in my signature. Because if people are interested, they're going to look for it, you know. Um, I reach out and talk to them about their Doberman Pinscher or their horse or their butterflies. I mean, that's how I build it. Or I compliment them. I'm like, oh, I, you know, that commercial you did was really beautiful. Or, oh, hey, you know, I'm also friends with so-and-so. Um, and, you know, I'll do, I've done lunches with people, you know, and we spend, you know, and this is somebody that, yeah, I'd love to work with them. And we spend the whole lunch talking about nothing having even remotely to do with film. And as we're getting up to leave, they say, send me your work. I might have something coming up. You know, but how much more powerful is it for them to ask than for me to be like, oh, you know, look at my stuff, you know, because they get that all day long again. You know, you just don't want to be that person. I don't want to be that. Maybe somebody does, but I don't want to be that person. So so that's how I handle it. I, I feel it. And it also it takes the pressure off. I have nothing to prove. I'm not selling anything. I'm not a salesman. I would be a horrible salesman. You know, but I'm pretty, I'm pretty good at being nice to people. I'm pretty good. I mean, something I care a lot about is, is other people is, you know, how can I help them? What up? And, you know, again, maybe it's not even me. Maybe it's like, oh, you should meet this person. I'm really good about that. You know, just being a matchmaker of, of like, oh, these two people need to meet. And sometimes it's obvious why they should meet. And sometimes it's just like, y'all have similar personalities and I don't know what's going to come of it, but you should know each other. So... That's, that's my answer to your question as a shy person. You know, how do you go in there? As I, I go in there with a sense of generosity and relating as a human as opposed to a salesperson. One of the quotes on your IMDb page is, evolve, study your strategies versus results and adjust course. Pay attention to what works for your peers and those who have come before. Ask for advice from experienced filmmakers. Definitely do not keep pursuing a course of action that is producing no results or poor results. And I've seen so many people ruin their careers because they were inflexible and unable to adapt. Yeah. So first off, did you, is that, is that one of your sort of mottos? Did you read that somewhere? No, that's me. That's I, you. That's an okay. honest, I mean, that's you a say that and I picture those people in my head. I'm not going to tell you who they are. <laughs> right. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> But but so that's like the thirty years culmination of of from sleeping on the egg crate to working on yeah. you know high end music videos and yeah. film and and yeah. seeing you know you know the ability to grow and adapt and revise your model inside your head the more you are malleable the more you're liable for success. The more that you're rigid, the more that you're right, the more that you have a liability for failure. Because the world, none of us know how the world works. We have clues, we have ideas, we have experiences based on our past and things that people tell us. 
But as humans, our perceptions are not, we don't perceive reality. You know, our sensory organs give us, you know, photons and audio vibrations that go into the circuitry of our brains and our biology manipulates it and 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 just the the subtleties in the human psyche and cross wires or whatever it is none of us looks at anything 100% objectively though we may think we do we color it we filter it we make assumptions based on prior experience and the best you can do is to, to try and learn when and where that's happening and, and try and counteract it, you know? But it's not 100% possible, you know? I mean, I just, I know that, that's why you've probably heard me say a few times that it's like, well, that's my perception and my experience. I'm not gonna tell you that's the way it is because I don't believe that's the way it is. It's how I experienced it in that moment and that's all I can articulate to you. You know, you should also ask this person and that person and trust your own senses. And, and I think that in doing that, you get a better picture because it's like, oh, they saw it a little differently and I saw it a little differently. And so you kind of synthesize, um, you know, it's, 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 um, you know, it's a fuzzy thing. It's like, what, are, what is it possibly? Um, you know, but, but the people I see fail are the ones who, who, well, not all of them, but some of the people I see fail are the ones who have this rigid idea that it works like this. You do this, you do this, you do this, and that happens. And when one of those things fails to produce, it's like, you know, Hollywood hates me. People are evil. You know, the system is, is rigged against me. Um, you know, I'm unlucky. I'm a victim, whatever, you know. And that's just not empowering. And even, even if somebody really did do a thing against you, even if somebody intentionally boned you, um, trip to you, you know, even if you met somebody and it really was rigged, if you surrender to victimhood, you've given up your power, you know, even if it's true. Don't accept the role. Accept, you know, accept that you have the power. And, and maybe you just don't go that way. Maybe you go this way or maybe you go that way. Again, that's the malleability. It's like, it's like okay, I thought that was going to work. It didn't work. I bashed my head. I tripped. Somebody either did or did not deliberately thwart me. That's all beside the point. What am I going to do now? But I've, I've just seen people who have that rigidity of thinking, you know, or that assumption that somebody else is persecuting them. Again, whether it's true or not really doesn't matter. Are you going to be empowered in that moment to divert or are you going to be stopped? That's a choice you have to make, and, and, and I'm not going to judge anybody based on their choice. It makes me sad if, if that keeps them from what they want, but it's their choice to make, and I respect that. So if someone is or isn't being kept from gatekeepers, whomever, from succeeding in mm -hmm. their mind, how do they say, okay, maybe that's true, maybe it's not, but I'm not going to except that that's going to keep me down. I'm not going to, i.e., accept the victimhood. Mm -hmm. What are they doing to get, I realize each situation will be specific, but sort of what kind of mindset, aside from that, what, what kind of action are they taking to make sure they don't stay in that victimhood? Well, one of the things that you can do, first of all, is not consider yourself an island. And by that, I go back to my example where I said, you're standing there and, and I tell you something, but what did that person see and what did you see? So don't keep it all here. Ask this person, ask this person, you know. You've got a team, we're all a team, we all have each other's backs. If you don't have friends like that, you've got the wrong friends. This is a business, this is an industry, as an artist, you need your posse. You need the people who believe in you. You need the people who hold you accountable to do the things you say you will do and follow through and will gently call you when you don't. Um, and you need the people that when you are in that moment and you are stuck and you feel that something has stopped you or someone has stopped you or you made a mistake, you can say, I, I just, I don't know what to do. do you, can, what do you think? Give me some advice, you know? And, and you can do it with peers, but this is also where mentors are really important. 
reach out to the people who are successful doing what you need to do. Because you know why? They've done it. They know how to make it happen. Again, they can't give you the roadmap because you will not take the same path. You will not meet the same people. But bits and pieces of what they say will apply. And they have had peers who've had different experiences. They're going to be able to give you advice and answers. And again, this is why I say people should have more than one mentor. Because every, you know, everyone's going to give you different advice. And it doesn't mean that one person's advice is better than another's. It's all based on their life experience. But if you have a variety, you have a variety of possibilities. You have chocolate, vanilla, and strawberry, you know. They're all good, you know. But which one is right in that moment for you? Um, so, so, so that's what I would tell them to do is, is, is just is just is is reach outside yourself, you know, seek advice, consult your mentors, consult your friends, um, you know, Google it. Put a put a post on a filmmaking board with complete strangers. Here's my challenge. What do you suggest? You know, throw it out to the universe and see what the universe throws back. Maybe, and maybe you have a better idea than anything I said. Please share that with me when you think of it. But um you know, to me, there's always possibilities. There's always, there's always in life, there's always that thing we've overlooked. You know, no matter what we consider, you know, if, if, if life gives us A, B, and C, there's always secret answer number D. We may not know what it is, you know, but we can look for it. We can go to our peers and our mentors to try and figure it out. And there may also be, you know, secret num secret answer E, F, and G. We, I don't know. But I refuse. If, if I look at the, at the evidence and it does not permit me to continue toward my goal, then, then, then I declare that that's incomplete evidence. And, and, and just because I don't see it doesn't mean it doesn't exist. So rigidity kills careers? I don't think it kills. I'm not going to say, I wouldn't be so absolutist to say that rigidity kills creators. But I would say that, that rigidity hobbles options. You know, rigidity limits your, your choices. And, and, and if you are willing to give up rigidity, if you're willing to give up being right, in my case, if you are willing to give up being shyness or, or being shy, if you declare that this goal of mine, this dream of mine, is more important than all those other things, that it opens doors. It gives you possibilities that do not exist if you say, my shyness is more important or my being right, I have to be right. That's your prerogative. You can be right, but you may not get that thing you want. As a freelancer, how have you determined how much to charge for your services? Oh, here's my big secret. If, if, if I didn't have to worry about paying my bills and being secure, that would be the last thing I would ever worry about. I consider myself an artist, and I do this because I love it. And for that reason, every morning I wake up and get to do it is like Christmas. And I love the people I get to collaborate with. They're my friends, they're my idols, they're my family. I mean, it's such a joy and it's such a privilege. Practically, I have these people who want money from me. I don't know why, but you know, they won't give me free housing or free food. You know, drat them. So, so I, I do, I do. And, and, you know, again, this is a song and dance. This is putting on a show because, because what's that fine line? You know, you get to a certain level of experience and you both deserve and need a certain level of income. And, um, you know, but at the same time, if you're slow, do you turn down less? So, you know, it's, it's, it's a fine line to walk. Um, part of my bulwark against this is having an agent. And not everybody has an agent, you know, but with the agent, we can be good cop, bad cop. Um, and I say that with the caveat that, that 
I never tell my agent to be an asshole. I don't want my agent to be an asshole. Again, I, I trust people, you know. But, but he will haggle. He will, in good faith, negotiate. Um, and, um, you know, so, so that's, that's important. Um, uh, in terms of if I, if, I mean, look, if I really like somebody and they don't have the money, I'll be like, you know what? I, I love you and you're an awesome creator and I just it would be a thrill to work with you. So you tell me what's in the budget and I'll see if I can make it work. You know, because again, it just it's it's not all about the money. Fortunately for me, I do have the agent, and fortunately, I have a lot of clients who have a lot of integrity, and you know, they will pay me the big dollars on the big jobs. And then if there's one that's less, they'll say, Well, this isn't quite as much. But then the next job they'll, you know, they'll get back up there again. It's not like, oh, you know, he worked for less, let's just keep paying him less. I mean, that would suck, you know, and I don't think that's a fair way to treat people. I wouldn't treat people that way. But um, and some people would, but again, I'm, I feel I'm very lucky. I have I have clients that that value me and they appreciate that I can be flexible, um, and they don't take advantage of that. And that's just brilliant. You know, that's the way to be. Now, I will also say that my success has harmed me in this way. And I'll tell you a story. I have a, a fellow I know, a filmmaker who I really respect, and I really wanted to work with him. And you know we had lunch, and then uh, a couple months later he calls me. He says, "Brad, I just got back from China. I sure wish you had been there with me." And I'm like, "Well, yeah, you know, I I wish I had been there with you too." <laughs> First, I'm hearing about it, and he says, "Well, you know, I told my producer. I said, let's get Brad on this," and she said, "We couldn't afford you." And I said, "I said, I said, well, that's funny because he, your producer didn't call me, and your producer didn't call my agent." The producer just looked at the level of work I did. It was like, oh, you, you can't, we can't afford him, you know? Or people will look at me and say, oh, no, no, he's, 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 he's going to want a truck and a techno crane and five cameras, you know? And it's like, it's, but that's just not true, you know? And I'm guilty of that when, but look, I was horrible with girls when I was a kid or when I was younger because I just, I couldn't ever bring myself to ask them for dates. I was so horribly shy. And when you don't ask for dates, you get zero dates, you know? And, and so I can't t say these people are idiots for making that assumption because I've been that way. You know, they look at somebody and they're like, they just, they're not gonna, and it would insult them to ask, so don't ask. How you handle that, I don't know, because I don't know those moments that they're having those thoughts. But I just, I honestly wish people would, would ask, you know, because, because, because look, again, I'm, I'm not all about the money, you know. It's like if somebody wants to work with me and it's a good job and I have the time and it's enough money, it's a reasonable amount, then I would consider it, you know. Now, if that person, again, took advantage of that and was just always nickel and diming me, well, that's not going to last. I'm going to move on. I don't like relationships like that. Again, I'm going to, no matter what you pay me, I'm going to give you 150%, you know, and if, and if, and if I feel that that's reciprocated in the relationship, then, then that's great. But if I feel I'm being taken advantage of, man, you know, life's too short. I'd rather not work than work with somebody taking advantage of me. Even if they're paying me a lot of money, if they're, if there's some aspect to that where they're taking me, taking advantage of me, I just, you know, I, you can see I don't have the mentality to be a millionaire entrepreneur. I'm not just all about the money. I, you know, being an artist and and my sanity are, are are very important to me, and and just being happy and being with people I like that that just means so much more. I mean, I I couldn't tell you the the rates I got paid for the jobs last year or the year before, but I could tell you about the 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 cool films I did and the people I worked with and the happy times. You know, I just, I consider money an evil necessity that we all have to deal with, you know. It's like, you know, I just, like I said, I wish I didn't have to pay those those pesky bills and then we could all just make art and, you know, have fun. At what point do you determine your worth from graduating from, I just want to do really cool things to then saying, well, but I do have amazing experience and I feel like I should be paid more. Mm -hmm. Um, 
Well, you're talking to somebody who tends to have low self-esteem and I don't have an ego. So it's kind of hard to embrace that. And I also really love what I do. <laughs> I'm throwing myself under the bus here. But I'm a pragmatist. I mean, obviously, I've got to, I've got to make a living. And um, <sighs> you know, what, what comes to mind is, is, is Blanche Dubois' comment in uh, The Glass Menagerie. I've always depended upon the kindness of strangers, you know, and I just... To me, it's I just have to work with the right people. I, I can't I I have to work with people who respect me enough to do the right thing. Um, as far as leveling up or upping my upping my salary, I mean maybe my agent could do that, you know. But but I'm always so it, if I'm excited about a job, I, I'm averse to price myself out of it. Um, that's just not my gift, you know. Even just like. Um, you know, mentorship and the advice I, I give. I've had people tell me, you should charge for that, you know? And I think about that, and it makes a certain kind of sense. But the problem I have with that is it's not egalitarian. What about the people who can't afford it? I mean, should they not have access to that information? I mean, I feel that they should. Um, I don't. I don't like saying you are worthy and you're not worthy. And I don't, that doesn't work for me. Um, I want everybody who is, wants to ask and is willing to apply it. Now, people who don't listen and don't apply it, well, they would fall out of favor. Um, but the people who, who listen and apply it, you know, they, I, I want to help them. And practically speaking, I, again, there's a lot of attrition. You know, it's one of the reasons I can do those things is because so few people stick with it. And so few people even come to me for advice in, in the first place. Um, and, and I never, of course, I never, I think a lot of people, and again, understandably, just kind of want me to make it happen for them. And that's just not how it works. You know, I can give them resources. I can point them in the right direction. You know, fortunately, I have videos like this now that I can say, here's a link, watch this, and then ask me whatever questions you have left over. Um, but, uh, you know, I just, this is something I don't want to charge for. And uh, um, I will say, I will say that, that, that as, a, as a kind of a counterpoint, there is something to be said with having skin in the game. Because I have had situations where I've helped people out and it was very easy for them to throw away an opportunity because it cost them nothing to attain it. So, you know, I don't know. I'm not old enough or wise enough to be able to decisively come down on one side and my compassion is the one prevailing and saying everybody should have access. And then, you know, it's up to you to put the skin in the game. It's up to you to commit. I, I can't control that. What factors into you saying yes to a project and what factors into you saying no? Let me limit my answer to a, a narrative, to scripted narrative, because, you know, there's so many other manifestations. But the one thing I would say is that it's, it's just got to be a great script. You know, I've, I've learned the hard way that, that no amount of talent behind or in front of the camera, no amount of money can compensate for a bad script. Meanwhile, you can take a really, really good script and, and have shabby technical values and still have a really entertaining movie. So I look at what I do as, as window dressing, you know, and I think it's important, of course, but, but if I don't have the skeleton to hang my pretty pictures on, then it's just going to be vacuous. So the first thing is that, is that I want to see a good script. The other thing is that I want to know that these people have enough money to do justice to that script. You know, I'm not going to be biased if you come at me with you know, $10 million, or if you come at me with $200,000, as long as you can do a good job on your script with that money. Um, if you're being unrealistic, to me that's like buying a ticket on the Titanic and I do not want to go down with it because I'll be blamed, you know, 
if there aren't the resources for the crew, if there aren't enough days, if there are unrealistic expectations, if there are tons of visual effects and not enough money to pay for them, it's gonna look like crap and my name's gonna be on it. I don't care how much they paid. I'm not gonna do it. Um, so, so, you know, a good script and the ability to do a good job with it. Um, and then I look at the collaborators, you know, who is the director, who is the producer, um, who are the other keys, the production designer, um, who's the talent, you know, the, the cast. Um, and if there are people I'm excited to work about, if they've done, or if, I'm, if, if there are people I'm excited to work with, if they've done good work, if I know them, um, you know, if they give me a really compelling pitch, I mean, all of that, you know, can can play to getting me excited. Um, and, um, you know, just like with the money, I wanna know that they have enough time. I don't want them to tell me they're gonna do a movie in three days, you know, because that's, again, I probably should have said resource instead of money. I, I just wanna make sure they have the resources, enough money, enough crew, enough time. And that's not saying you have to have a, a ton of any of those things. You don't have to have a ton of money. You don't have to have a ton of crew or a ton of days, but, you know, you can't have a shoot with three location moves in a day and two crew people. And, you know, it's just, uh, unless you're shooting guerrilla style, in which case, I mean, that's a legitimate form of filmmaking, but for me as a cinematographer, what does that do for me? I mean, does that show anything that I wanna show? There are some DPs who will embrace that because that's their jam and that's wonderful. But for me, I'm a, I'm a very, you know, painterly and interactive. I mean, I want to affect the image and if I don't feel I'm, you know, if I feel, to me that would be damage control. If there's too many location moves and it's just like set up an exposure, set up the camera, focus, get an exposure, shoot, move. I'm like, where's the creativity for me in that? You know, again, somebody else maybe it's there, but for me, I don't necessarily feel it's there. And I might be wrong. Somebody might pitch me a movie and convince me, oh yeah, here, you know, you can do it this way and that way. Again, this is the whole malleable thinking. I mean, I'm okay. Well, I would I would break that rule because you've convinced me. Um, but just as a general thing, I, I want to see that I can practically achieve something. I'm going to be proud to put my name on, and won't be embarrassed by. Um, and then you know the last thing is is money. You know, I mean, um, is it a friend asking me to come help out on a weekend? Is it a movie asking me to go to Brazil and shoot for two months? Um, you know, what is it? And so, uh, uh, you know, I would, I, would, I would consider that. And if it's something I really, really wanna do, well, I at least have to make enough to make my bills, you know? Um, but ideally, you know, I, we, well, you wanna make enough to have some savings and, and have fun and, Especially when I tr do travel jobs, you know, I like I like bringing you know Kathy with me, and um, or you know, and and then we have some vacation days, and um, you know, like if we go to Canada or or you know wherever, um, just you know, turn it into a little mini holiday because most of the traveling, I've I've been all over the world, I've been to every continent except Antarctica, and um, it's ninety five percent work travel. And what I do is I'll build in extra days, you know, I'll, I'll stay a little longer or I'll go early or, you know, if there's a break in the middle, but I turn it into these little vacations and, you know, it's just super fun. Have you ever turned down work and then when you looked back on it, realized maybe it was a mistake? Oh, yes. I have a great story. And this is a money thing, too. <laughs> and it goes the opposite way of what I've been saying. So, yeah, I had a friend of mine, um, a casting director who I really got along with, and he had cast some movies that I shot. And he pitched me. He said, you know, Don Coscarelli, the guy who did Phantasm, is uh, doing a horror movie, and it's a horror comedy, and, and they would like you to, to shoot it. And it was this movie called Bubba Hotep. Um, and I thought, well, that sounds fun because, you know, I like ancient Egypt and I like horror and I like comedy. And um, they called me up and we talked and I said, oh, that's great. And they said, you know, what's the rate? 
And they said $400. And I'm like, okay, $400 a day. I can, you know, I can make that work. Um, and I said, okay, yeah, $400 a day is fine. And they said, no, it's, it's $400 a week. And, and either this was right when I was starting music videos or right before, but anyway, I was making a lot of money at the time. And I'm just like, I'm just like, I just can't, I can't see that happening, you know? And I turned it down and I was fine with that. Well, it turned out that they cast Bruce Campbell and Ossie Davis in it. You know, two amazing, legendary actors. And it's a cult classic. And, and, and I just kick myself. I'm like, oh my God, I wish I had done that movie. You know, I just, in retrospect, I don't give a shit. I would have done it for free. Um, but, but you just never know. I mean, I've, I've done movies that I took a chance on and then they came out crappy. Um, I don't know. I, I, that was, that's just my experience. That was, that was one that I wish I had made a different decision. But, but when I looked at the cards on the table, they just didn't make sense. Can we revisit your crossover moments? How did you go from not having shot anything to then shooting something? But I would call that a breakthrough. That would be my vocabulary for that. And, and those are, you know, transformative moments when the paradigm shifts. Um, the first thing I, I shot was in college. I mean, I don't think that that's significant and that's probably not what you mean. But the first time I got my hands on a camera and rolled film was in college. Um, but that was when, as you said, I wanted to be a director. The first time after I had made up my mind to be a cinematographer was an interesting story. And as many of these stories are, I mean, so, so many of the things that have happened in my career do not proceed in an obvious way. They're, they're just serendipitous. Um, a woman had reached out to me, and I believe her name was Alice Lee in Houston. And... Um, Never, you know, she never heard of her before. And she reached out to me and she wanted to shoot this short film. And um, I had never shot anything and I don't remember who recommended me, but I'm like, yes, I'm all in, let's do it. And the only thing I remember about this film was that she wanted to put candles up in a tree. And I remember thinking, how are you going to do that? And how is it not going to burn down? Um... And I had this buddy named Fujio Watanabe, who's still a really one of my closest friends. And I, you know, he, we, he and I had met on, um, I don't remember where we met, but anyway, we, we met somewhere. Um, and uh, I knew he wanted to be an AD, so I kind of got him involved. So he and I were going to do this thing. And then as often happens with young filmmakers, Alice just kind of, evaporated. I don't know where she went. I've never heard from her again. I wish her well. I hope she's happy doing cool things. Um, but Alice recommended me to a guy who came into town to film a ESPN promo for a bicycle race called the Branders Tour. And this is 1989. And they wanted to shoot this in 35 millimeter film. Um, and uh, she said I was the guy. You bless her. I mean, I had never shot anything. I mean, shot 16 millimeter black and white in college. I knew, I mean, I, I knew the theory. And again, as a visual artist, I knew how to make a frame and make a pretty picture. Um, but that was my first job. It was a paying job shooting 35 millimeter film. <laughs> and uh, I still have it, you know, I still have that video. Um, and um, it's really still very good. I'm very proud of it uh, to this day. Um, it was finished in, you know, standard definition. Um, but that's, that's how I got my first opportunity. And then I parlayed that into doing some pickups on a movie and um, shooting some short films for friends on video. Um, I didn't do a whole lot before I kind of got the, you know, bright idea to prank my parents and send myself to Houston. So, so it was right after that that I was in, in L.A. and doing the, you know, the student films in between, you know, temporary work. 
Did you go to an agency, temp agency? Like the, yep. Yeah, I remember I remember those. the name, Perfect Match. Oh, okay. Yep. They were their own sort of engine. Yeah, yep. I would go to those. Um, this mystery woman that just contacted you, you never knew how she got your information? or I'm sure I did. I've just forgotten. Oh, I, I see. I don't okay. know. I mean, the, the mystery isn't so much that she found me. The mystery is that she just disappeared without finishing her project and and somehow felt, an, you know, good enough about me to recommend me to this guy who came into town. I mean, you know, if it wasn't for, I mean, she's like a guardian angel. If it wasn't for her, who knows? Interesting. Wow. That's its own film right there. there yeah. So then how did you go from shooting something to shooting something significant? But that depends on how you define significant, you know. Um, there are increments of significantness you know, in my career, for instance, um, you know, I, I came out to LA and, and I was doing these these crazy student films. Um, you know, some of them were good, some of them weren't, some of them I never saw again. Um, and then I had that moment where I realized I have to work with people who are doing it for a living. And I started working at Concord. So in a way, those were significant. I'm not I'm not proud of those films because um, you know they were just super cheesy exploitation movies, but they were significant in the sense that I was for the first time a professional cinematographer. Um, you know, apart from the handful of stuff in Houston, I guess I was a professional LA cinematographer. Um, I was being paid, and I was working with other professionals, and I met people on that job who remain friends to this day. One of the people I met on that job, the editor on that job, edited A California Christmas. So, and he and I are just BFFs. His name's Brett Headland. He, you should in, in interview him, he's amazing. Um, he also directed a film for them. He directed a film called uh, um, Something Something Paxton County. He's gonna kill me for not remembering it, but anyway, it's Paxton County that he did. Um, but anyway, he's just an amazing guy, and, and we met on that. And so that's significant. And I, again, some of the, you know, a, a lot of those people have, have you know, become very significant players. Uh, you know, one of the guys at Concord is the EP on Raised by Wolves. Um, another guy is, you know, directing and producing films in South Africa and Bulgaria. Uh, another guy lives here in, in, in Pasadena and produces stuff for Lionsgate. Um, you know, so that's certainly significant. Um, in terms of, of films I'm proud of, probably the first one it came out of, it was the same producer I was working with on those films. Um, he partnered with this director who's a really gifted guy named uh, Rolf Konevsky. And Rolf had this uh, indie movie he wanted to make about um, these kids who go into a video store um, and, and the video, is late and they want to charge a late fee and one of the kids pulls out a prop gun and things get out of hand and it's you know this crazy movie um, which was a lot of fun to shoot um, and I could we could spend an hour just talking about that movie because that was something you know it took place in this one video store and we're like how do we keep that interesting you know and I, I won't get into it because it did go on and on but there were a lot of things that we did to keep it always visually interesting and not monotonous um, and, and it was a movie that I'm very proud of. And it also is a movie that unfortunately, um, due to some contractual matters, has never been released in the US. And um, I would love to see that change. And I have made some efforts to try and make that change. And right now it's just kind of in limbo. But uh, it, that one is significant because it's one of the first films that I was really, really proud of and still to this day. And at the time I was, a member of the Friars Club, they had this tier where you could join under 36 and pay a, a, an affordable fee. And, and I arranged, we had, we had a premiere and we, I arranged because I remember to do an after party at the Friars Club. So it was very hoity-toity. My parents came into town from Houston, my brother and sister, um, and we just made this, that was our big Hollywood night. Um, and then, you know, one of the, the significant films that I did that the public saw was um, uh, a movie called Cook County, which I was super proud of. And um, it's a very dark film and some people don't like it, but what I always tell people is they don't like it for the right reason. 
you know, it's a dark, we did our job. I'm not insulted by people not liking it because those people are so awful and the circumstances so grim. I take that as a backhanded compliment. Um, and, and of course, you know, uh, the music videos I've shot, um, you know, Britney Spears' Toxic, it's, I like it, but it's not my favorite, but everybody knows that freaking video and that's significant. So, so I, I hate to kind of shotgun that answer, but, but, but to limit significant to just one thing would be difficult. Each of those was significant in its own way, either for me personally or, or in terms of what it did for my career, because, you know, without, um, you know, the cheesy exploitation stuff at Concord, I may have never done the other stuff. I don't know. And then how did you go from shooting something significant to shooting something utterly groundbreaking? <sighs> well, I I think I'm too humble to call anything I've ever done groundbreaking. What, what do you consider groundbreaking? What should I address this to? Well, maybe something where, okay, if you're not one to, let's say, beat your own chest, which uh -huh. I respect, I, I, I find that usually people that do excellent work usually fall into that category, but that's just my own bias. Um, but something where you were taken out of it almost as if you f forgot you were even in the project. That's where I think you really can know something is special. That's, that's, a, that's a very fair uh, way to describe it. I, I've had that feeling a number of times, and, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take the easy way out and, and pick A California Christmas because it's the most recent and the most fresh in my mind. But absolutely, there was an ease as we shot that. And, and how did I get that? Oh, my God, I did a social media post, and it was one of those like it was a scavenger hunt of this to that to this to that to that. And it began with me answering a Craigslist ad in 2011, um, which are notoriously dodgy. And, you know, you'll, you'll, you'll reply to a thousand of them just to get one reply. And then chances are you're going to be standing on set saying, what the hell have I gotten myself into? You know, but at the time I had I had gotten a few good jobs. I actually got a union feature working with name actors off of Craigslist at one point. Um, um, and that was this particular job. And I the producer I worked with was a fellow named Noel Vega and really nice guy. And I, I hit it off with him and we stayed in touch. Always good about staying in touch. You know, that's another thing that young people have to know is, is you can't let relationships go cold, even no matter how much people like you. If you're not, you know, if it's out of sight, out of mind, you know, just like your, your, your friends that you, you know, drink beer and, 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 and you know, go hiking with. It's like if you stop calling them, they doesn't mean they don't love you, but they're going to forget. So, you know, we would circle back and have lunch and do calls and emails. And really, it was like six six years before, or five years, and we, he never hired me for anything, but that was okay because I still thought he was a cool guy. But in 2016, he he rings me up and he says, I, you know, I'm doing a World War II movie. And I think, oh, that's awesome. I love history and that sounds big and epic and fun. And I'd like, you know, to suggest you. And I said, please do. And, and I came down and I interviewed with these two producers, um, a fellow named Leon and a fellow named Ian, and uh, they were really nice. And then there was a director named Sean Piccinino, and, and we just we just clicked. It was like you know my my long lost friend. You know we we just really he was very easygoing and uh, uh, creative and enthusiastic, and, and we just just hit it off. And so we did the movie, and we just had a great time. And and one of the things. Early on, it was it was a little tragic because because we had, I had a Siamese cat. Me and Kathy had a Siamese cat named Simon, who I just I just love so much, and he was my my little soulmate. Um, and he had cancer, and I had to go to Alameda for a week on this first week, and I wanted to get him surgery, and I just he was so special that that I through crowdfunding and some loans, I raised like $14,000 to to get him this experimental treatment. And I was up in Alameda, and I remember the day that I got the last of the money, 
And I called Kathy to tell her, and she was crying, and she had just put him to sleep. I was just the worst, oh my God, even, even saying it again is just horrible. And, and, and so I was living with that, and, and I was so upset and worried that I had gotten shingles. And, and um, you know, Noel actually sent me home a day early, and they, they, one day they shot without me. Um, and I, re- I would have stayed. I mean, I'm just that guy, you know, that I would have stayed, you know, wounded and bleeding. But I think he, he really felt that, I mean, he wanted me to finish the movie and he felt that I needed that break. And then he, he was probably right. But anyway, so, so we did it and the rest of the movie was amazing. Had such a good time, you know, shooting these old airplanes, working with visual effects. And I love visual effects so much. Um, one of the things I like about movie making is just the magic, the sleight of hand, you know, doing something with a camera or an object or a trick, um, you know, that, that that makes it seem to be something other than what it really is. Uh, so so we had fun with that. Um, and, you know, Sean and I hit it off and we, we stayed in touch. Uh, 2017, the next year, they decided that they were going to add some of the epilogue to that story where the pilots... It was about the Doolittle raid, and so the pilots um, go to bomb Tokyo in retaliation for Pearl Harbor, and the that was the part we shot. And then after that, they were supposed to land in China, but they were spotted by a fishing boat that was determined to be radioing their position, and, and so they had to launch early, and as a result, they were low on fuel, and their planes, they had to ditch their planes and some of them, you know, landed in, in enemy territory. Some of them landed in the boondocks. One of them diverted to Russia, uh, where they were had been prohibited from landing. Um, so we went to China, uh, and we were there for three weeks. Uh, it was like, I think, two, one or two weeks of prep and a week or two of shooting. I don't remember exactly. But boy, was that fun. Gosh, I love going to other countries and shooting stuff. And, you know, we worked with a lot of the local crew. Um, I had just a fabulous time. I'm a vegetarian, so everybody had a lot of fun with, you know, how hard it was for me to find food. I, you know, here, Chinese food, you just always can get vegetarian stuff. And I have an aunt who's Chinese, and she warned me. She said, it's not going to be easy over there. And I'm like, okay, well, we'll see. And she was so right. Mm. And and thank goodness, we my gaffer, Eddie Chan, who lives in, you know, up up the street in Shadow Hills, uh, he he's bilingual. And... Um, you know, him and a couple of other people, if it wasn't for them, I'd go in a restaurant, I'd be like, I have no idea. And and honestly, almost every dish had meat in it. So so they would have to say, make that, but take out the meat. Um, but anyway, uh, so it was a, just a super experience. Um, and then the following year, 2019, or am I skipping a year? Anyway, 2019, uh, Sean called me up to do a science fiction TV series called Salvage Marines that we shot in Baton Rouge. And I met even more people that I really like. You know, um, Jamie Thompson is a producer I worked with on that, who I've worked with since, and he lives in Houston. You know, all this stuff is very circular. But but Jamie, like me, is a very Hakuna Matata kind of guy, and we had some drama thrown at us. But, you know, between me and Jamie and Sean, we were just such, you know, level-headed, laid-back generally happy people that we, we we made it work. So I just had all these great experiences. Now, meanwhile, um, as early ba- as, as Doolittle's Heroes, the World War II movie, Sean had been scouted by this company called ESX, um, which is run by a fellow named Ali Afshar, who is another really amazing fellow. And he's, he's also an actor. And it's so funny because you think, you know, oh, the producer acted in the movie. That's kind of a vanity thing, but he's really good. He played Leo, and and there's a lot of people who think Manny, like the real Manny and Leo, were the the characters who stole that movie. Um, so you know he's just he's just terrific, and he's such a nice guy. He's like your your buddy. You know he's just he's he's one of the guys. He's not one of those people who you know when you're sitting with him you're like oh god the executive producer. He's just this wonderful, funny, snarky person. Um, so anyway. 
Sean started working with with these guys, and they had a, a go to DP in place that you know shot all their other stuff. And they said, "Oh, you know, Sean, we want to work with our team." Which, you know, of course, I'm sad that that's kind of the director I have a relationship with. But at the same time, I have been the beneficiary of that you know same loyalty. So I'm like, you know, who am I? <laughs> who am I to be too mad about it? So um, anyway, Sean did like four or five movies with them that that I didn't shoot. Um, and then we come to California Christmas and um, that DP had some kind of commitment with his parents and wasn't available. And so Sean's like, you gotta use Brad. And, and again, I knew these people because Brett, the editor and the guy who did stand at Paxton County, there it is, Brett, stand at County, Paxton, Paxton County. Brett, um, they're part of the company. And I had already known them through this networking group that I belong to. Like I'm friends with the composer, Jamie Christofferson. Um, I knew Ali. Um, I had been invited to a lot of their test screenings and given feedback. So I was known to them. And so when Sean pitched me, you know, it wasn't like, you know, who's that? And um, they they signed me up and I was so happy, you know, that I, I ended up getting that job. And um you know, when I was when I was on the job, I just remember it was it was so easy because I mean we were dealing with COVID protocols. We were one of the first films back to start shooting, um, you know, under COVID uh, protocols. Um, we had a limited crew. We didn't have a big budget. You know, we had limited equipment. But again, because you know of my experience doing things like working at Concord, you know I could make very parsimonious choices. You know I had what I needed. Plus, again, the miracle of technology with RGB LEDs. You know I had Airy Sky panels. I had Titan Astera tubes. You know I could do any color I wanted. I could do fire flickers. They're they're small. They're bright. They're you know I just couldn't have done it without them. And I had a couple of HMIs. Um, and everybody was just so nice. Um, you know, Josh and Lauren, the lead actors. I mean, if if I want to talk about everybody who was nice, I would just go through the whole cast and crew list. And I know we don't have time for that, but it's it, it was just this miraculous vibe. And there were times on set where I was like, you know, when this is over, it's it's never going to happen again. I mean, it's this was a very special moment, and and I felt very good about what we were getting. I knew that we had some pretty pictures. I knew we had some moving performances. Um, you know, until something is, is put together, there's always the possibility that, oh, it didn't work out like I thought. But again, you know, we had Brett as the editor, Brett Headland, and he is just so good. And I've known him for so many years. Um, I've never seen him cut anything bad ever. Um, and, uh, um, you know, Jamie, the composer, did a good job, and uh, uh, Keith Rausch, the colorist. You know, it's just it was just one of those things where the stars aligned and it was magic. And um, I wish I could take credit for more than just a tiny fraction of that, you know, great recipe. Uh, but, you know, everybody else did their part. Everybody else brought the magic. And... Um, you know, you can't plan things like that. You can hire the right people. You can green light the right script. And that's certainly hedging your bet. Just like when we were talking about success earlier, you can't you can't 100% invoke it, but you can, you know, you can hedge your bet in that direction. And they really did. They made the right choices. They chose a really good team. Um, you know, Daniel Aspromonte, our line producer, did a hell of a lot of work you know, making the uh, um, right decisions in terms of the COVID, um, in terms of, you know, the budget, you know, how to allocate it. I mean, we never, he and I never went round and round about anything. I tried to be reasonable. I said, you know, what numbers do you want to hit on these equipment packages? And I went to my vendors who I had relationships with. And, you know, between me doing some horse trading and then, you know, giving us a little generosity, we, we just made it all work. Um, and uh, Caitlin Epperly too, who um, is is uh, Daniel's girlfriend. She and and Jamie wrote these just friggin' amazing songs, um, and I hope they get released because some of them there's just a snippet of them in in the movie. But I've heard the entire songs, and uh, oh my god, I, they just should be hits. They're so good.
When is it time for an artist to get an agent? That answer is going to be different depending on whether you ask the artist or the agent. <laughs> um, you know, popular media has done a great disservice to creative people in the expectation they have created for what an agent does. Because there's this whole mythology that agents discover unknown people and turn them into stars and build their careers. And in my experience, that is, is, is it's like a unicorn. Maybe it happens, I don't know those people. I've never had that agent. Um, and when I tell people this, they're like, well, what do you pay them 10% for? And um, oh my God, they take 10% of the jobs you get yourself. And I say, I say, they, they bring the value because my agents at least negotiate my deals. And typically they'll, if nothing else, get what they call an agent fee, which means the client pays the 10%. Um, sometimes they get me more money, sometimes they get me more per diem, sometimes they get me a better hotel room. But even if they didn't do any of those things, there is a cachet and a prestige to having an agent. And at a certain point in your career, I think you are expected to have an agent. Um, having said that, I know some really prominent people who don't have agents, you know, just like some of them don't have cars. And, you know, Bill Murray doesn't have an agent. He has an 800 number. So if you're Bill Murray, you can do that. Um, but, you know, I, I, I just... The reality with an agent is I don't think any agent... Uh, agents... Agents are, it's again, we have to remind ourselves, we think of ourselves as artists. We think that this is art and we are creating art. It's a business. Everybody's in this for business, you know, except lunatics like, like me. And um, those agents make 10%. And if you make diddly squat, 10% of diddly squat is not going to look good on their ledgers. And so they're not going to sign you. Um, they don't, they're not in the business of investing in people. And you, you know, you might say, oh, well, that's kind of harsh. And you know, why don't they take a chance? But again, remember, there are all those successful working people out there. Remember, we were talking about the volunteering. Why would you work for free? It's like, who's going to pay you when there are a hundred experienced people over here that they could also pay? So why is an agent going to build your career when there are all these experienced people who don't have an agent who are making a good salary, you know, if they're gonna invest, they're gonna invest in those guys and they're still not gonna invest in those guys. So, you know, it's, it's you really kind of have to be in that position where, where your numbers are worth, you know, cashing in on. And the other thing is typically um, agents will, when you're, when you're at that place, an agent will, will seek you out. You know, you've, you've won a, a festival award. And, and that could be an exception too. I mean, maybe if you just had this amazing festival film, maybe they would roll the dice on you, but that's probably in anticipation of the fact that, you know, Netflix and Hulu and Amazon are going to be offering you some, some opportunities. Um, but, uh, you know, there are people, you know, who feel you can get out there and cold call agents. I, I early on had an agent, you know, who I just sought out but but they didn't do much but take 10%. And you, know, you really have to consider that, um, uh, you know, why are they signing you? And, and if, if they're just, if you're just 10% to them, then, then and, and they're not a brand name, they're not a recognizable agent. I mean, is that the right thing? And I, I'm not saying it is or it isn't because I don't know. I mean, you know, maybe that little bit of prestige is a thing that you feel works. Maybe somebody who would hire you also thinks it, it works. But you have to realize that that the premium agents, the people at the big seven, they are who they are because of their, their Rolodexes. You know, they can pick up the phone and call those people you want to know. Those people you want to know will take their calls. Um, they'll answer their emails. And, you know, Joe, Joe nobody, they're not going to take the calls and they're not going to respond. So, you know, it's all it's all a matter of influence. And uh, um, I do feel like, you know, sometimes there's projects I want to work on and I'll tell my agent, you know, and I'm saying, you know, make a call to these people and, you know, let them know I'm interested. And do you know anybody? Do you know this person? Do you know that person? Um, 
you know, but but by and large, you know, my agent is not calling me up with jobs every week. It's very rare they send me a job and and they don't call me up with with new clients. And I've talked to some peers and a few people have slightly different experiences, but by and large, this is the average. This is what, you know, most below the line agents are like. And I think most directors agents too. Um, when you ask that question to the artist, the artist is going to say, I want an agent right now because they have bought into that mythology. You know, they think that that I'm talented, I'm good, I have something to show. And the only way I'm going to break down those doors is if I get somebody to walk me in and I need an agent. And and it's just it's just not true. And it's 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 not going to happen for a lot of people. And just like I said earlier, if, if your thinking is rigid such that next step is agent, you don't get agent, you're stuck, you're lost. You know, you have to, you have to negotiate past that roadblock because, um, you know, maybe you will get an agent. You know, maybe you'll get an agent later. I mean, I've had several agents. But, um, you know, the thing is, is that my experience in this business is even when you have an agent, you still have to do it all yourself. It's all on you. Everybody, and again, it's a human thing because look, I would love for somebody to show up and say, oh, Brad, you know, here, let me take you and get you this meeting and here's a job and here's a limo and we're going to take you to your new house in Beverly Hills. And, you know, that's that's the dream, isn't it, for every human being, but it's just not the reality. I mean, just like, again, there's the exception. Sure, that happens to some people. You know, but if it doesn't happen for you, does that mean you're going to stop? You know, I've been a very working class filmmaker all my life, and I've had agents, and I've been a member of the Canadian Society of Cinematographers, and I've been a member of, you know, the International uh, Cinematographers Guild. Um, I've done a lot of things and I have a lot of associations and a lot of friends. And, you know, sometimes, you know, Noel Vega will call me up and suggest me for a movie that leads to a bunch of other stuff. And that's great. And it, it happens, you know, but I can't wait around for that to happen. I can't, I can't um, make achieving my goal dependent on an external force or an agent. You know, it's it's really Again, like I said, I have an agent. I've had an agent for quite a few years, and I like him. I think he's a really good agent. But you know, I'm not waiting around for him. You know, I, I he does what he does, and that is, you know, um, that is just complementary to what I do. I, I run my own show. Uh, I just recently had for for California Christmas. Sean and I hired a publicist. And we really liked our publicist. And it's something that I did because I had wished I had done it earlier in my career. And I really didn't, um, you know, because you, you're, you're on films and you're with companies and they have publicists. But eventually you come to realize that those publicists are not publicizing you. They're publicizing the movie or the stars or the, or the production company or the director. Um, you know, but if you hire your own publicist, that publicist is publicizing you. So, um, you know, but even with this publicist on, I still had several days when, when the movie was blowing up on Netflix where I sat in front of my computer posting and answering and emailing literally all day and I wouldn't stop to eat and I would work through the night and into the next day like a crazy person. And my, you know, Kathy was like, you know, you're, you're going to hurt your health. You're insane. And I said, you know, Kathy, this movie is not always going to be at number one. And while it's at number one, I have to do this. If I, if I don't do this and people have forgotten, it's going to be too late. And people could say I'm a crazy person and I didn't have balance. And maybe they're right. You know, I mean, how do we ever know that we're doing the right thing. But but in that moment, I felt that's what I needed to do. And, and so that's what I did. Um, but, you know, you asked about agents and I gave you a life philosophy. <laughs> but I like that. How would you handle it if you were working on a project with great people, it's magical, great chemistry, but they're a little bit behind on paying you? Mm -hmm. How would you approach that? What, what do you mean by a little bit behind? <laughs> Couple months. If that'd be a long project, um, I'd hand it off to my agent. I'd tell my agent to deal with it, you know, and have 
they have a legal team and I I would I would keep doing I mean I I certainly wouldn't confront any of my creative partners or probably even tell them about it. Um, I mean, I might if I felt they would have influence with the production company, you know, but I wouldn't threaten them. I wouldn't be one of those guys like, I'm going to walk off, you know. Again, I, I'm committed to the work first. And even if even if those bastards never paid me, I'd, I'd finish the job and never work with them again, you know. But, but, but to me, somebody else's bad behavior is not a license for me to also have bad behavior. Um, you know, again, if somebody's being unsafe, if somebody's being jeopardized, you know, or harassed or harmed, that would be different. I would certainly, you know, become defensive and confrontational in that responsibility, you know, as, as you know, to whatever degree was, was necessary in the moment. But, you know, by and large, I believe in, in di diplomacy and professionalism. And, and if it's just that my pay is late, um, I certainly wouldn't be happy about it, but I'm not going to harm the work and I'm not going to harm my relationship with the parties who are not directly involved in that, you know, predicament. How about earlier in your career when you did not have an agent? Well, you know, it would it would still be a similar strategy, but I I would not jeopardize my position on the project. I would I would not go into DEFCON mode until after the project wrapped. You know, and even then I wouldn't be, you know, impolitic about it. I would, you know, I would be professional. I would, you know, I would give them notice and then I would either get a lawyer or I would, you know, file a complaint um, with the labor board. You know, I would, you know, do the right things. If I was in the union, I would, you know, or I mean, I, I am in the union now, but if I was at the time, I would report it to the union. And that's the other thing too, is if I was on that job, in addition to sicking my agent on them, I would sick the union on them. Um, but but it, if I was all on my own, I would, like I said, I would just wait until, you know, I would not be happy, but I would put up with it until we were done. And then I would go through the, you know, the legal avenues available to me. And, and if I ended up getting boned in the end, and even if I didn't, even if they ended up paying, if I had a bad experience and felt they were being predatory, I would just never work with them again. You know, to, to answer that, it's like, look, you know, in, in, in withholding my pay, they're already harming me, right? You know, but if I pee in my own well, then that's adding harm, you know? If I, if I, um, provoke them in such a way that they spread, you know, bad stories about me, even if they're in the wrong, I don't know who they know, you know? If, if the producer or the or director or, my, you know, the actors, you know, if I create a situation where they think I have some bad behavior, you know, that's going to harm me. I don't, you know, there's no value in that. To me, that's just, that's just adding, adding my own harm to it. Um, and I just don't think it's going to improve it. And that's, that's just based on my value because, again, I'm their first and foremost for the work and the relationships. How much time do you spend each day improving your craft as a cinematographer? Well, see, that's one of those formula questions. There's there's just no formulas. Um, there is no bullet point on my calendar every day. Um, I nebulously engage, you know, I read the news, I read IMDb Pro News, I engage on social media, I belong to networking groups, I belong to, you know, groups specifically about film lenses, I belong to cinematographer groups, I belong to professional groups like the Canadian Society of Cinematographers, the Visual Effects Society, and, you know, I look, what are people talking about? You know, what are the articles they're posting? I might come across an article and post it. Um, so it, it, it's really, I mean, I do my due diligence and I do my check-ins, but if, if, if it's a day where there's really nothing on those boards or on the news, then, then I probably don't do too much. If it's a day that there's significant amounts of stuff, you know, if I have the time, then, then I'll be watching some videos and reading some articles, um, you know, maybe bookmarking them if I don't have the time. Uh, you know, I do, I do, I'll do webinars and, and workshops and, you know, in, in a normal era, era where we're not in a, in a pandemic, I'll go to trade shows and product demos. 
um, which, you know, in as much as they're important, you know, to learning about your craft and, and the new technologies, they're also networking opportunities. Um, and it's fun to me. It's not, it's not, it's not work. I mean, again, these are, these are toys. It's like, what's the new toy? What's the cool thing? You know, it's, you know, instead of a 4k camera, you have an 8k camera and, and why should I care? You know? And, um, you know, now you've got these affordable anamorphic lenses. Where did those come from? And how are they different from the, you know, tens of thousands of dollars lenses? And, uh, um, you know, now you've got these RGB LEDs that can do any color under the sun and they can do a, a cop light and they can do a strobe and they can do, um, you know, fire flicker. And I just, I love that because cool, that's a new toy and I, you know, either rent it or go out and buy it. Um, so uh, again, there's no, I can't tell you how many hours a day, but, but it's certainly, you know, one of my focuses. It's one of the things that, uh, that, that, that um, you know, just like when somebody reads the news, they check, you know, the, the, the national section and the international section and the, the comics and the one ads, for instance. It's like, you know, that's one of those things that, you know, every day I'm like, okay, what's, you know, what do I need to check with? How much time do you spend trying to book your next job? Huh. I could say 24/7 considering I have a website. <laughs> you know, I have I have posts and 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 social media identities on LinkedIn and you know, to me that's like little fish poles with bait that are stuck out into the into the water 24/7. Um, you know, I I network, I plant those seeds. I have people out there that I hope are recommending me and saying good things. You know, maybe that you you would call that passive, but to me that's all you know, sometimes those get me more work than me picking up a phone or or asking or going to lunch. You know, it's those it's those those ripples you put out into the world. You know, just like you obviously did your research on my website. I didn't have anything to do with that. Um, I mean, I created it, but I you know you and I didn't talk about it. Um, in terms of in terms of me personally, you know, it really depends on the days. Um, when 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 California Christmas was blowing up, I was looking at. IMDb films in pre-production and, and just reaching out to people, you know, because I thought, you know, now's the moment I can, you know, reach out and say, hey, I've got a number one film. Um, but you have to balance that, you know, with life. And uh, I could easily be a workaholic, as I've already kind of let you know that I would work through meals and through the night. Um, and, you know, I I network and, and hustle far more than I shoot. You know, there's this great quote by uh, um, Orson Welles, um, and it's something to the effect that, you know, he, he, he probably made a mistake becoming a filmmaker um, because it's, you know, 2% making movies and 98% begging for the money to make them. Uh, I'm paraphrasing, but that's the essence of part of that quote. Um, and, and it really is. I mean, so much of our work is getting work. What I, I like to tell people that I am professionally unemployed because what most people do only a few times in their life in between jobs, I do constantly. Even when I'm on a job, I'm looking for work, you know? So, so really, if you looked at how I spend the hours in, in my day, I'm professionally unemployed. <laughs> When you first started out, was it the same percentage of time that you were looking for work? Absolutely not. And, and that's naivete. You know, I really felt build it and they will come. You know, I really felt that, um, I mean, I had never been a freelancer before. I didn't understand the dynamic of working as a freelancer. I didn't understand the importance of networking. I had only ever worked for a company where they meet you once and they hire you and then you just keep showing up and, you know, doing the time card until you quit or get fired. Um, so it really was a, a huge learning curve for me. And, and there were a lot of illusions, just like when I moved to Los Angeles, I thought, oh, you know, it's a huge city. Somebody's going to hire me. Somebody's going to give me a job. And I was so full of shit, you know, and, and I guess mercifully so because because if I really realized how hard it was going to be, would I have done it? I'd probably, but it, 
I wouldn't have been as hopeful and optimistic. It would have been more oppressive to live with the reality of what lay ahead of me instead of being blissfully ignorant. Do you think working at these temp jobs prepared you because it's the same thing? Like when you would work at these temp jobs and one of these things would end and okay, accounting doesn't need you anymore. I don't know what you were doing, but, and then you had to go and let the temp company know I'm available this week. Yeah. I mean, in little ways, I think because, because like you could wait for them to call you if they had a job for you, but you could also wake up at 6 a.m. and call and say, I'm available and you were more likely to get something. You know, so there was that incentive, be proactive, you know, and um, um, I'm not a morning person. I mean, left to my own devices, I wake up at 10. So for me to wake up at 6 a.m., that was a superhuman feat. Um, it's not so hard if it's a call time and I'm getting paid, but, you know, just to call, you know, wake up and make a call because maybe I'll get paid to go do a job that I really don't want to do. Oh, my God. Yes. Well, you know. We also don't want to go to the clinic and get shots, but we have to. So it's just, you know, I'm at that age now. I, you have to get a colonoscopy every five years. It's, I'd rather go to Disneyland, but, you know, the, there are things in life you have to do. And, and when I was out here, calling the temp agency at 6 a.m. was one of them. And it was, you know, again, it was a good habit. It was discipline. It's like, you know, do that thing you don't want to do because you have to. You know, no, you, your boss isn't telling you to and your mom and dad and girlfriend aren't telling you to. And if you don't, nobody's going to be mad at you. You just aren't going to work. <laughs> Brad, how many times do you read a screenplay before day one of filming? Probably read it in its entirety at least twice. But then like I'll read the individual scenes as the director and I are planning them. You know, like I don't read the script front to back, but I will revisit those scenes. Like, how are we going to light this when we're scouting, um, when I'm ordering equipment? You know, I go back through and I'm like, you know, who's doing what? Somebody's standing by the window, somebody picking something up. It's day, it's night. Um, so, so, you know, two complete passes at least, and then an indeterminate number of revisiting various scenes. Is it important for a cinematographer to understand story structure? I'll answer that with an analogy. It's important for a cinematographer to understand story structure in the same way that it is important for a person driving a car to understand how to read a map. Because no matter how well you do it, if you don't know what your ultimate destination is, and you don't know the path you're going to take to get there, you are going to have problems and you are not going to do your best job. Um, you are not going to be able to plan well. In the case of the cinematographer, you are not going to be able to allocate your resources of budget, crew, and equipment um, much the same way that the guy driving the car is not going to be able to know how much gas to buy and how often to stop for it and where those gas stations are and is going to you know, end up calling AAA. So... Um, there's no triple A in film, by the way, kids. So uh, yeah, um, you really do have to understand it. And um, also editing. Cinematographers need to understand editing. You need to understand how those shots you make are going to be used, how they relate to one another. And the practical um, aspects of that are as follows. Um, again, uh, I would lean on a quote. There's this great quote by David Fincher that says, you're not really a director until you are standing on set. You've got five shots left to get. The sun is going down and you're only going to get three. So you have to decide, you know, which three are those going to be. And that's the same with the cinematographer. And if you understand story structure, if you understand editing, in your mind, you'd be like, I, I need that, I need that, I don't need that. That would be a luxury, but those I have to have because otherwise I can't tell it. Or maybe, ooh, I could do it in a one -er. Let's just do it in a one -er. um, If you understand those things, it gives you that facility. And conversely, as you're shooting the scene, um, you may think, oh, you know what? I, the director didn't ask for it, but we need a cutaway. He, he may want a moment. It's like, all I've got are these two singles. 
Like, like what if he wants a moment of, of you know, where he wants to, to cut? I'm like, okay, I'm going to get a shot of her picking up the glass and him taking a bite of his food and the waiter just coming out and, you know, asking them if they need anything, whatever. I mean, you know, when I, when I do multi-camera shoots, I always tell my, my additional camera people that if there's ever a scene where you don't have a shot, find B-roll, find a cutaway, shoot, never not be shooting, always shoot me something, you know, get me details. Um, and, and so many times those details get got and I see them in the cut. You know, and when we did uh, Doolittle's Heroes, I was so proud of my team because um, we did this scene in an officers' club, um, and we, you know we did some scenes with with the uh, the cast, and we had this beautiful steady cam coming out of the actress's face. Um, but um, we ran out of time at the end of the day. Now we got all of our shots, but we kind of had wanted to go get some shots of the band just because I was like, oh, I think we're going to need some B roll. Well, I look down there and there's my crew shooting that shit without me even telling them. I'm like, all right, you know, I trained you guys well. They went down there and while we were all breaking down, the, the musicians are up there doing their thing. And they and guess what? Those shots are in the cut, you know? So, so yeah, it's, it's you know, the more, the more you know, the better you'll do. Even if, even if, you know, sometimes things don't necessarily seem obvious, you know, it's, um, uh, being informed is important. Again, just like, you know, the person driving cross country. I mean, it, it might be weird to think that they should know where, you know, where all the Walmarts are. But, you know, what if they get somewhere and I'm like, damn, I need some wet wipes. You know, and I'm not saying you should do all the things, but, but you know, preparation. You know, I was, a, I was a Boy Scout. Be prepared. Do you take any notes or storyboard when you go through the script? Yes. Uh, I used to do it a lot when we had paper scripts, but now so many of my scripts are digital, but I'll do like a notebook or I'll have like um, just a note, you know, a, like a, win, a Word document or even an email on my computer. More often than not, it's an email and I'll save it into drafts because, because if it's a Word document, it's on my computer, but if it's a, a draft email, if I'm on my phone or wherever, I can pull it up and be like, oh yeah, there it is. Um, there's probably a better way to do that, uh, but uh, that's what I've been doing. Um, and I typically only draw stuff if if I want to use it to illustrate something to another person. Um, I mean, I'm, I, I occasionally will do it for myself, but I have a pretty good visual memory in in that in that respect. So uh, if I see it, I'm. I'm likely going to remember it, or I could even just give myself a little note, and then you know, pull the visual out of my out of my memory. Do you come up with a shot list, or do you leave that to the director? You know, that can go both ways. I mean, I feel personally that that's the prerogative of the director. I've had directors ask me to do it, and I've done it. Um, if if somebody were to come to me and say, "What would be your preference?" My preference would be for the director to do a draft and then let me have a crack at, at you know offering suggestions, you know, and make it a true collaboration. And the reason I would have them go first is because again, I want to defer to them as the director and and at least start with the seed of their vision rather than telling them what they should do. Um, but once I kind of get into their head and I see where they're going. I can give them, you know, well, how about this? How about that? You know, this complements those ideas. You know, that's an interesting idea, but instead of that, what if you did this? Um, you know, and I can use their stuff as jumping off points. Um, I've worked with directors before who just don't give me a lot to hang stuff on. And, and, and it really is challenging because I, I want to be deferential, but, you know, if you don't give me anything, then basically, I'm going to be directing everything but the performances. You know, if you tell me to do the shot list and you don't engage with me about it, you know, I mean, at least, you know, talk to me about what I come up with and let's let's beat it into shape. Um, then then you know, okay. And you know, different people work different ways, and that's fine. You know, uh, I've I've worked with people who were very controlling and they wanted you know to you know exert influence over every aspect and i've worked with people where i felt like literally 
I was doing their job and they were just paying, being paid to watch the monitor. Um, and then everything in between. And, you know, again, my, my favorite is some form of collaboration, whether they originate it or I originate it. You know, I want that interaction where, where we're building it together. You know, I like, I like that. How much do you plan out the day before you shoot? A hundred percent. Um, I, you know, when, when I scout, I figure out, ideally I have my gaffer and key grip with me. Um, but even if I don't, I figure out where I'm going to put the lights, what those lights are going to be. I have a sense of what the power is going to be. I have a sense of how we're going to move from one scene to another scene. And often as a result, I will talk to the AD and I'll say, you know, that's a really big scene and this is a really big scene. Can we take this little small scene and stick it in the middle so that 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 I have something quick to go to and then the people could spend a little more time on this? You know, um, I'm very conscientious of, of the pace of the day. I don't want to go from something big to something big because, you know, that's, that's a lot of crap to move and, and build up and break down adjacent. Um, you know, and, and if it's necessary, if it has to be because of the actor availability, then, then, then I, I'll build that into my plan for the day. I'll be like, okay, we'll just take a bullet on that. You know, we're going to have to pull up time somewhere else or we'll have to light more simply. Um, you know, whatever that solution is, at the end of the day, you have to make your days. I know a lot of people do these crazy 24-hour days, and I've done them before, but I, not often and not recently. You know, more often than not, the jobs I'm on now are just they want hard outs at 12 hours. And I'm okay with that because, yeah, I don't want to, you know, beat the crew to death, and I, I don't want to be super tired. Um, so it's, it's kind of incumbent on us you know, to, to make our days and to plan correctly. And also, again, when I'm evaluating the, the project initially, I want to know, you know, do they have enough days to do what they say they want to do? Do they have enough crew? If all of that stuff lines up, then I can expect, you know, that a six-page day is going to look like what I expect a six-page day to look like, and I'll manage it accordingly. And if we fall behind in the day, I'll make adjustments to, to pick up the pace. Um, you know, rarely we may have to push a scene to another day, um, you know, spin it off to a second unit. Um, sometimes we actually get ahead and we're like, let's pull a scene from tomorrow. Let's get ahead. Um, you know, I always like to say that Murphy's on the call sheet, whether you put him there or not. Shit's going to happen. I mean, you just have to account for that. You can't, you can't say this is going to be a perfect day and nothing's going to happen. You have to know stuff's going to happen. And you have to have your backup plans where you're like, if I have to simplify, what will I do? Um, and, and have some sense of what that is. Um, you have to know where you're going to want your crew to be at any given time. And, and, you know, I'm telling them, you know, I need you to move that light over there. It doesn't play now and it doesn't play in the next scene. But the scene after that, I'm going to want it and I don't want to wait for it. So get it over there and run the power, and then we'll go inside and we'll turn the light on. It's all of that stuff. It's, it's just having that, that, that holistic sense of, of the day, of, of how long it takes to get things done, and to just make sure that nobody is ever waiting on you. How do you know an actor is the real deal? Well, I would say there are different flavors of real deal. You know, there are different, there are people who bring the performance in different ways that are moving and convincing. But, you know, uh, it's it's really those moments when I'm behind a camera and, and I disengage as a technician and become an audience member, you know, and, and I feel a tear in my eye or I have to take my hand off the camera because I'm laughing so hard that it's going to shake the camera or, or there's a scene in California Christmas that where... Um, Callie and her mom are in uh, the truck talking about her mom's uh, cancer. And, and every time we did that scene, I just wanted to walk from behind the camera and just go give them a hug. You know, I just had this strong like, oh, my God, I'm so sorry. And uh, those are the moments for me, you know, when, you know, or, or also I've worked on movies where somebody played a bad person and, and, you know, I remember thinking on set that, you know, that guy's kind of an asshole. 
and then and then later on like we become best friends you know so it's 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 very weird you know um i worked with rutger hauer once and uh my god that guy was just amazing and, and and this is another one of those things that we could do a whole one of these just with my rutger hauer stories but i'll tell you one of my favorite ones is um we were shooting in brazil and we were shooting out in the uh the rainforest near ubatuba and we were in a hut and rutger was standing by a window threatening somebody and i had a, a low camera angle looking up at him and I remember I was watching through the camera and he's like, you know, yada, 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 yada. And his chrome was kind of, his gun was chrome. And, you know, yada, yada, yada. And all of a sudden he, he did, he said something. And in this precise moment, he did a gesture with the gun and he flashed the camera with a flare. And I thought, oh, that's perfect. Oh my God, it will never happen again. Oh, how tragic that's, I hope they use that take. So we rolled again and by God, God, he flashed the camera again. And I'm like, well, now that can't be a coincidence. So I, I go up and I ask Rutger. Now, you know, Rutger's a legend. I mean, he did Blade Runner and The Hitcher and Legend and heaven knows what else. And so I'm, there's not a lot of actors I work with where I'm a fan and I just kind of have to not let that you know, surface up, but he, you know, I just thought the world to him. And the other thing is when you get to know him, because, you know, so many of his characters are just big meanies, but he was a teddy bear. He was a, a gentle soul and an artist. So I go up and I say, Rutger, I said, are you flashing the lens? And he goes, oh, I'm sorry. Did you not like that? I don't have to do it. And I'm like, no, my God, how do you have that level of control and the geometry to just get that right? And to know that to punctuate that 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 scene, and I was just like, and he was so humble and so unpretentious. Um, he he would ask me, you know, what lens is it? Is it a fifty? Is it a? 30? And I would tell him it was a thirty-five, and he'd be like, and he would play everything inside. The I never had to say raise the gun. You know, you're out. You know, you're you're, you're outside. Your he knew if I told him what that lens was, he knew where he needed to be, um, and. Um, you know, I uh, just such an amazing guy. I have to tell you one more story of his. There was another scene where we had a, a plane crash and it was in another world, it would have been a second unit scene because it really didn't have the principal actors in it. And so it was Rutgers day off and they had built this nose cone of a plane, a full size nose cone. And we had a field and they wanted to just put bodies in it. And people were kind of, you know, going around helping the wounded. Um, and, you know, so we're out there getting this shit set up. And the director says, Brad, you know, raise the camera. And I'm like, okay. So I lean over and the camera assistant unlocks a leg and I unlock a leg. Well, I'll unlock this and we lift it up. And then she locked a leg, I locked a leg. And this other hand comes in and locks a leg. And I look over, it's freaking Rutger. I'm like, Rutger, what are you doing here? It's your day off. He says, I don't want to sit around the hotel. This is where all the fun is. And he, I'm sure he didn't get paid. He came out there and he was he was helping them place background. This is Rutger freaking Howard is placing background and locking tripod legs. You know that he was a solid dude, man. And and you know now bless him that he's passed away. I want to tell you that his email address was fartville at aol.com. Hmm. Gotta love this guy, right? <laughs> what qualities are you looking for in an actor? It seems like a strange question to ask a DP, but because um, I don't really get to cho choose the actors, <laughs> but things that I appreciate, I mean, I appreciate their ability to hit a mark. Um, if they don't hit a mark, oh, you know, my poor ACs, you know, especially on the long lenses and the focus. Um, but yeah, I like them to be able to hit a mark. I like them to have a sense that, you know, if we follow their hands that they don't go quick. Because if I'm doing a tilt and they go, you know, lift it up quick, I'm gonna lose it. You know, have a nice, you know, let me be able to f understand that the camera is following you. Um, you know, to be able to find their light, to have a sense that, you know, this. if I hold my face this way, I've got good light on it. But if I look that way, I got shadows in my eyes. You know, some people are just, you know, like a, a guy like Rutgers just, he's gonna be there, you know, but maybe somebody else, or maybe like, you know, you have to keep raising your chin because when you put your chin down, I can't see your eyes. Um, uh, 
you know, the ability to have, uh, again, had just have a sense of where the camera is, you know, um, especially with things like stunts, but, you know, stunt coordinators can help with that. Um, but, you know, really, uh, those are the things that I, and of course I want them to be good performers because if, if their performance is crap, it doesn't matter how good it looks. But, I, you know, I work with good actors these days. I don't, it's been a long time since I worked with anybody that I thought was wanting as a, as a performer. You know, sometimes you have the extraordinary ones. Rutger was extraordinary. I worked with uh, Elliot Gould and Lainey Kazan. They were just stunning, fabulous. Um, you know, Josh and, and Lauren were magical, you know. Uh, um, and again, I'm, I know I'm leaving out people who I shouldn't. When I, Cook County, you know, uh, Xander Berkeley, Anson Mount, Ryan Donahue, Polly Cole, you know, all of those leads were just, just amazing. I mean, you know, people wouldn't hate that movie. Not, I mean, everybody doesn't, but the people who just vehemently don't like it wouldn't feel that way if those characters weren't real to them, you know? And for the people who do like the movie, it's tragic for the same reason, because those characters are real. Um, you know, whereas California Christmas was just that perfect, magical escape in the time of COVID for everybody who just wanted that magic. And, and you know, they brought it. And, um, you know, Amanda Detmer, the one who played the mom, you know, the little girl, Hannah, you know, I mean, they were just all of them. Um, uh, David Del Rio, who was Manny, uh, Ali Afshar, um, um, you know, the fellow who played Connor. I mean, that's like, you know, again, it's just, it was just like every one of those person was a hit. And one of the things, it's a little off topic, but one of the things I loved about it, which I credit equally to the actors and to Sean, the director, and to Lauren, the screenwriter, is that all of those characters are sympathetic. I mean, even the ones in with the conflicts, the ones that in a stereotype presentation, you would, you know, they would be the villain. It's like, but they were all complex. And if you really thought about it, sympathetic. So, um, you know, I, I just, I, I love all of that kind of thing from a performance point of view. But, but really, again, you know, if you ask me as a DP, it's, you know, hit your marks, find your light, and, and don't move so fast that the camera can't follow you. What do you do when time is running out and the actor does not have the lines memorized? That's the director's problem. <laughs> I, I, what can I do? There's not diddly squat I can do. Um, you know, I, maybe they do, um, you know, maybe they do cue cards. Um, typically, unless it's specified, we don't have a teleprompter. And even with a teleprompter, they'd be looking into the lens. And you could put, you, actually, you could take a teleprompter and put it off outside the lens. Um, you know, I, I don't know if I was the director, what would I do? I mean, I, I guess I would cover it in a way that I could try and be on angles where I could loop it later. You know, I would try, you know, and I, I would simplify the dialogue. I would like cut stuff out, like how, you know, can you at least memorize this? Um, and if it was a chronic problem, I guess you'd have to think about recasting. So yeah, that, that's my answer. How do you know that the director is the real deal? I'm not especially big on, on judging people in an absolute way. So what I would characterize is, is, is directors I am most fulfilled working with. And, and that would be interactive ones, you know? I, I want somebody who both brings ideas and has, you know, very strong feelings, but is also collaborative, you know? and is willing to, if a better idea is presented, you know, whether it's the producer or the actor or the craft services person, is open to considering that, you know, because it's, it's about the movie we are all making, not about, you know, their ego. Um, so that's my, that's my preferred archetype. Um, uh, the ones who aren't prepared, you know, frustrate me because we should all be prepared. Um, the ones who, you know, when I say, how would you like to shoot this? And they say, what do you think? A few times, that's okay. I mean, sh I've asked my lighting crew before. I'm a little stymied. Do you have any ideas? 
But but if that is the standard MO, well, I'm carrying them and it's it's not fun for me. I mean, maybe it would be fun for somebody else. Maybe there's you know, a DP out there who just has delusions of grandeur and is a wannabe director who would be thrilled to work with that person. But for me, um, it's it's a collaboration, you know? I wanna feel like we're, we're doing something together and if I'm getting nothing from them, then it's kinda like, it's just not that much fun. Um, and same on the other hand, if I have somebody who is really overbearing and controlling and I feel like I have no input, then I just, you know, I don't, it's not fun, it's not exciting, it's kinda like, I just feel like I'm, um, you know, just a, uh, I don't even know what you'd call it, just a, um, a, a worker drone, you know, just taking instructions and not, not interpreting at all. So, uh, you know, again, to me, the sweet spot is in the middle. And there's a range too. I mean, you know, it could be, you know, a little more me or a little more them. I mean, that's okay. You know, it could tilt. And, and you know, with, with good people, sometimes it does tilt. You know, sometimes, you know, like I said, you know, sometimes, you know, somebody may say to me, why don't you take the lead on this one? I'm like, okay, let's do that. You know, or sometimes they're like, no, I know exactly how I want this. Um, so, so, you know, that dynamic being, being uh, flexible and throughout, that's okay, but it's, it's really that when you get in that default mode, if it tilts too far one way or the other and just every day is like that, then, you know, it's, that's not the thing that gets me excited to get out of bed in the morning. What is not being prepared? Um, well, not having a sense of how you want to cover a scene not having a sense of, of the type of coverage you want, not having some sense of how you wanna cut the scene. And, and I will qualify this by saying, it's perfectly okay to have that idea and get on set and have an epiphany and throw it all away and say, let's do something different. That's fine, you know? But at least we have a fallback plan. We are never gonna get to set and go, I. I don't know what I want to do, <laughs> you know, and then, you know, time drags to a stop. Anytime that stuff happens, you know, in my mind, it's sand going out of my hourglass to do nice lighting. You know, if somebody's eating up time. If, if time is being wasted, I'm going to have to make up for it because somebody's going to say, light it simpler, light it quicker, shoot it in less, you know, less coverage. Um, you know, that's, that's where the, 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 the buck is going to stop. And that's, it's depressing to me, you know, in the same way that I don't want the director waiting on me to light a scene. You know, I want the people to have that already roughed in so that when we walk in there, it comes in and maybe just some tweaks. Um, in that same way, I don't really want to be sitting there waiting on somebody else, whether it's the director or wardrobe or the actor. Cause you know, if we're, I've, I've worked with, there's a particular music video artist I worked with who just showed up six hours late, you know, well, that's, that's that person's money. You know, they paid for it. They paid our salaries, but you know, it's like, that's again, that's not why I'm there is to make that money. I mean, I want, you know, you show up and I show up. I don't want to show up at 6 a.m you know, but we do because we are supposed to and we get the thing done and and you have the time as the director or the actor to, to make your magic and I have the time to make my magic. And, and, and that happens in being prepared and not, you know, waiting for being on set to get that shit sorted out. How do you handle a director not liking your suggestions? Uh... Well, as a general thing, I'm ambivalent and I defer to them because they're the director, you know? Um, if they never liked my suggestions, I would feel we weren't a good match, you know? I mean, I wouldn't hold it against them. I don't, again, I'm not gonna judge them just because their aesthetic is different than mine, you know, but we may have an incompatible aesthetic. Um, and that's just what my judgment would be. But, but, yeah, I mean, if they were belligerent and insulting and, and made it personal, well, that would be weird. I've never had that happen, you know, but for them to say, no, I don't like that idea, I'm, I'm not attached to it. I, look, I, we're all putting something in the pot to make something amazing. And like I said, you know, if, 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 if the PA comes up and gives me a lighting idea and it's better than mine, I'm going to do it. 
and I'll give them credit for it. You know, it's it's you know all for one and one for all. I'm not an ego person at all. I'm not I'm I'm not that way, and I don't particularly care to work with people who are. Generally speaking, how much time does it take to light a scene? That is a range between zero seconds and infinity. <laughs> okay. I mean, what's the scene? Are we, you know, standing outside in a in a close up with beautiful backlight and and a cliff face that's bouncing light so it's perfect and I just turn on the camera? Or are we shooting a shot that starts in um, you know, uh uh you know, the 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 101 freeway and and somebody's walking down and the Hollywood Boulevard. I mean, well, that would probably be available lighting, but the, or, or or is it like a, a steady cam shot where we we walk into this house and we walk through the back and we go into the neighbor's yard and across the street? You know what I'm saying? It's you can't. There's no generic answer. It's like it's like it could be simple. It could be complicated. You'd have to you'd have to give me a specific scene. And even inside of a specific scene, I can say. Well, here's how long it would take if I wanted to do a really good job. And if we don't have a lot of time, here's an abbreviated version. So in California Christmas, yeah. when we first see them sitting at the kitchen nook or the breakfast table, yeah. and we're finding out different things about the characters, I don't yeah. want to, spoilers, I don't want to give too much away, but that there's an issue. Yeah. Um, and I think it's a daylight scene. It, it looks like it's more morning. Yeah. I think they're making breakfast. Yeah. How long did it take to light that scene? It was beautiful light. Thank you. Um, 20 minutes maybe. Um, but uh, I had it roughed in before we got there. You know, we, we didn't wait on it. That was already set up and we walked into it. Ah, okay. So you're talking about 20 minutes once you walked in. No. Oh, oh okay. It took the guys who went over there to do it 20 minutes while we were shooting something else. And then we got there and while the actors were getting set and the props were getting set and the camera was getting set, the lighting crew tweaked it and did not infringe upon our time at all. Ah, okay. But mm -hmm. the sun went down. So then we had to put a silk over that back window. I don't know if it was that scene, but we shot, you know, we block shot a whole bunch of stuff in there um, I should. I do. We didn't block shoot it. That's not. That's not correct. We we shot. We we would move the cameras around between the scenes, but um, but you know we shot all of the scenes in that space at the same time. And uh, um, when the sun went down, I had to cover that front window with diffusion. So if you pay close attention at a certain point, you're seeing detail out there, and then it's just white. And uh, and so that took a little bit of a reset, and we did have to wait on that because we were in the middle of that set. But it wasn't long. I mean, it took, um, I don't know, five, five, ten minutes to reset that. But, you know, the barn took a long time. <laughs> you know, that barn, we had them in there pre, I had a, we were on a shoot and I had, we were on a day and, and, and I was like, okay, let's shoot exteriors so I can spin the crew off and get them started on that barn because it's going to take a long time. So, you know, and also the bar. The bar took a while, and that was—I was nervous because we did not have a pre-light. But we we did it so that we started small. We started on a small area of the bar, and as we were shooting that behind us, they were finishing the lighting. But I mean, that's just another thing. Is like you know, you do not want to wait. You want you want to get up shooting as fast as possible. How do you decide when to move the camera? Well, again, I primarily defer to the director, um, but but. I'm not one of those people who likes gratuitous movement. I've worked on shows. There are certain styles of filmmaking where gratuitous movement and it's just like always keep the camera moving. I, I like it to be motivated. I like there to be a reason for it to be moving. Um, and, and I just intuitively, it's like when I'm in that space, I'll feel that moment where I'm like, you know, we really should go from here and then slide over to that person. Or, you know, just how cool we got to follow them in through this door and outside. Um, um, I would probably like to move the camera a little more than I do. But when you move the camera, it can complicate lighting because you have to hide stands, you're seeing more of the space. Um, you have to have a, you know, and I, 
if I was given a choice between moving a camera or doing cool lighting, I would I would probably do the cool lighting. Um, I know people who do less than cool lighting to permit more camera movement, and you know that I, again, that's a legitimate aesthetic, but it's not my preferred aesthetic. Um, but but in a perfect world, you could have both. Um, um, and again, like I said, I just uh, unmotivated movement. It's a distraction. I, I just I think even with lighting, I mean, you, you could do cool lighting that doesn't complement a scene, you know. And and uh, it, it should never be about making yourself look good. It should be about complementing the actors and complementing the story. You know, telling telling that story in a way that the that the people lose themselves in it. Um, you know, one of the things that visual effects artists often say is that is that our best work is the work that nobody notices. And I feel that that's, that's kind of true for me. I mean, I always like it, of course, when people say, well, that was really pretty and that was beautiful. But, but I hope that it's because it complemented that moment and that they, you know, they saw these two people in love and it was just so beautiful. Um, and not that it was like distracting in some kind of way because that's not, you know, that's, that doesn't serve the, 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 the higher purpose that we're all supposed to be there for. When you shot the video store, one location, yeah. teens, sort of sounds like the thriller yeah. type movie. What were you focusing on? Movement or lighting or how are you making it interesting within that one space? Well, you know, there was there was a little bit of all of the above. I, you know, the director, Rolf Konevsky, is, you know, just really passionate about coverage. He has lots of different ideas about, about getting... Um, a variety of coverage on scenes. Um, and again, we had motion where we needed to have it. Um, and some of the things that we did to keep that movie interesting, um, you know, in the beginning of the movie, they're all standing up and they're talking. And um, so we kept like the top half of the walls had colored bands on them and they had colored neons. Um, and the bottom halves of the walls were gray. And um, so we came up with a, a design where the lighting would evolve. And um, um, in the beginning, it's just, you know, a very neutral, fluorescent lit thing with these, these neon signs. And um, then this, this conflict occurs. And at first, people, it's like all fun and games. And so they turn off the fluorescent lights, and I motivated from those neons, I put my own lights above them and I match those colors and it's like now it's kind of a nightclub. So I'm like, you know, they're, they're having fun. It's kind of a nightclub feel. Um, and then, then things get more serious and, and those lights go out. And there was, a, there, was a, there was a dramatic motivation for that to happen. Um, and then there's a confrontation where these spotlights are shining through the windows and it became almost monochrome. And, and the angles, there were a lot of angles like this. So you're not seeing the colored bands anymore. You're seeing the gray, you're seeing the ceiling. Um, so all of those things, you know, it was like, I remember thinking, man, if it looks the same for 90 minutes, it's gonna be so boring. And, and it's not gonna be dramatic. And so the, the lighting had to be a partner with that story and, and, and create those, those moods. And you know, to Rolf's credit, he created that justification in the story and with the characters, and and we had just a hell of a lot of fun with it. It was, you know, one of the things I love about both that movie and California Christmas is the variety of looks. You know, um, I do like I love the look of of Cook County, but it's mostly this kind of grim, raw look, which is a cool look, but like in California Christmas, you've got the breakfast scene and you've got the barn at night where they're, you know, lifting the food and you've got the party with the red and you've got the bar with the blue and you've got outside the bar. You've got all these different looks and that's just, man, that's so much fun. And, and, and those are the ones I'm proud of. Uh, and, and so it was the same thing with this movie Tomorrow by Midnight is you just have all these really different looks. And, and that also, as a, for an audience member, it disconnects them from what came before because it's like, you know, okay, this is, 
visually, this is a whole new thing. You know, we've gone to another place and and that was important for the story. And it was important to keep the visuals fresh again. So people aren't just going, oh my God, it's that wall again. <laughs> How does camera movement make a shot better? But the first thing that I would say is that is that camera movement does not automatically make a shot better. It can make a shot worse. Um, you know, that would be like saying, um, how does drinking a margarita make things better? You know, uh, sometimes it does. And there are other times that, well, it probably wouldn't be the best thing. Um, so, you know, in, in terms of um, the ways in which it does make it better is, you know, for instance, if, we, if we're slowly moving into somebody as they're having a realization and that, that dawning is happening on their, their face, and, and as they're having the realization, we're pushing in, we're getting close, we're getting intimate, we're getting uncomfortably close to them. The audience is you're like, you're carrying them along and you're like, oh my God, I'm right in their face and that emotion is just huge. You know, that's awesome. You know, or, or if you're discovering something, you know, you're, you're in a steady cam and you're following them and it's like, what is it? You know what? And you see them and they're looking and what do you, it's like, oh my God, you know, whatever. Um, you know, things like that where you, where, you know, again, you are the audience's proxy, you know, and, and, and how is it interesting to them? Is it interesting to them to just sit and watch these people talk, blah, 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 you know? Or, or do we feel we want to take that audience and let's get them in closer, you know? Or let's do a move where we suddenly don't see this person's face, you know, and they're going to be thinking, why don't I see that person's face? You know, what, what are they saying? What are they doing? What are they looking at, you know? Um, I have this really f favorite story from Rosemary's Baby, and um, the cinematographer was talking about, there's a scene where Ruth Gordon is on a phone, sitting on a bed, and, 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 it, and the camera's at the end of a hall. And the director said, okay, you know, set the camera up. So he, you know, he got Ruth Gordon on the bed, and she's perfectly framed you know, within the door, and he sets up the camera, it's this great shot, and the director comes and he says, no, 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 move the camera over, move the camera over. And, um, and he says, okay, so he moves the camera over, and the director says, no, move it over some more. And he moved it over so far that all you see is Ruth Gordon's back, you don't see her face. And this guy's like, okay, well, that's really weird. So they finish the movie, they go into the theater, the DP is sitting there watching an audience watch the movie. That scene comes on, and the audience goes to see around the door. Now, that's not an example of a move, but that is an example of what, where are you taking the audience with your camera, you know? And, 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 and really, that's the, when you get them to that point, you know, where they are like so engaged with this two-dimensional projection of light that they're primal instincts kick in and against common sense they lean to see around the corner you know again just like the, the the idea of the steady cam where you're leading them you know through this place it's like you you're building anticipation what am i going to see i'm with that character what's going to happen to them what's going to come out of over there you know or or you know that emotional moment where you get right up into the face um, so, you know, again, to me, to me, that's really what it's all about. It's about, it's about, you know, with the audience, like how are you pushing those, those primal buttons in such a way that even a non-verbal proto-humid would respond to? What have you been the most terrified on set and what is the scariest shot you've ever gotten? Well, the most terrified I ever was on set um, gosh, years ago now, I um, worked on this MTV show called Senseless Acts of Video. And the premise was that they took scenes in music videos, crazy scenes that were achieved by VFX, and replicated them as stunts. And um, had some good time shooting that. That was a fun shoot. But there was this one particular 
scene, we had this guy named Troy. He was our stuntman. And he had what's called a wingsuit. And in base jumping, that's people who basically just jump off of buildings and cliffs and crap with a parachute. So pretty scary stuff. And, and one of the things in base jumping is this, this wingsuit where like Rocky the Squirrel, you spread your arms and these little bits of material come out. And I mean, it doesn't, you know, it doesn't keep you aloft, but it lets you kind of, rather than going straight down, it lets you get a little bit of soaring before you deploy your, 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 your uh, parachute. And uh, we were shooting in the Grand Canyon where he was going to jump off. And I have a fear of heights. And, and part of my fear of heights is because I'm kind of clumsy. And, and I just, you know, I don't want to stumble over something and whoosh, go over the edge. Because I'd be that guy. I'd be the guy in the news that went over the edge. <clears throat> and um, I remember we were shooting in an area... There was, there was um, Native American territory. So it didn't have the fences and the railings. I mean, it's literally just, there's the edge, there's oblivion. And, and, and some of the guys are like, oh my God, let's go look over the edge. You know, oh, that's awesome, 1,800 feet down. Brett, come look, come look. I'm like, hell no. I wouldn't get within six feet of that edge. I figured if I'm gonna fall, I'm gonna have something to land on. So I didn't do it. and. Um, because of the nature of the stunt, we had a lot of cameras. And this was these were like TV sports cameras, you know, the ones with the really big lenses, the super long zooms. We were shooting it on video. And, and I think I had, gosh, six, eight cameras, plus I had a bunch of cameras mounted on this. There was also a plane. Um, and uh, I remember I got there and I, and I asked the crew, I, I wanted to be fair, I said, I said, I said, who's afraid of heights? And nobody said they were afraid of heights. And I said, fine, I'm gonna be on the camera at the bottom of the canyon. <laughs> and you guys are gonna be on the ones around the edge. Um, they cabled them in. Everybody had like a cable tied off to a stake or something. Um, and the cameras were just right there. And I was like, oh my God, but, but I would take a helicopter and go down, which was also interesting because um, in the canyon, because the air is going through the canyon, it's very turbulent. So as you go down, it's like, ah. Oh. But even, I was okay with that because you know what, as long as there's something between me and eternity, I'm, I'm, I'm okay. So I, even though that was uncomfortable, it was much better than standing at the edge of the canyon. Um, but later on, after we wrapped, some of those guys were like, I was just shitting myself. And I'm like, you said you weren't afraid of heights. I was, I was being diplomatic, because if, if they had, I mean, I don't know what I would have done, drawn straws or something, but, but I, wouldn't, I would have tried not to make anybody who was uncomfortable do it. But that was, that was the, to me, the scariest moment on set. Um, in terms of the scariest shot, wow. Um, I, I, don't, I don't have one offhand, but I'm, I'm well, I do, I do have one, actually, yeah. So we had... Uh, you know, this was 2002, and there were no digital cameras, there were no GoPros, and I had an Airy 3, which is, you know, big 35 millimeter camera, and we were mounting them onto bikes to get these really hot shots. And we had one mounted on the, the left rear tire of a bike, and, and it was mounted with this rigging called Doggy Cam which at the time was new and it was these thin rails as opposed to speed rail, which is this big, you know, big, much more rigid stuff. And the, the stunt was that the bike was supposed to drive right at this car and at the last minute veer off, just a near miss. And um, so we rigged it. Now, one of the things was we had so many stunt riders on that. That, that we had exhausted, at least as I was told, we had exhausted the experienced people and they had brought in trick riders, people from Vegas who do hot, you know, hot rod stuff that's you know, not necessarily precision movie stunts. Um, and I don't know who, if this person was one of those, I really don't, but we did have some people who were taking chances that you know, the director 
uh, the second unit director, who was a professional writer, he was like, you know, don't do that. That's that's not what you're supposed to do. Um, but these guys were hot doggers. Um, but anyway, on this particular one, um, I, I remember I was sitting, standing on the road, and I, I see in the distance this car coming, and I see him just getting smaller and smaller. And then all of a sudden, there was like this explosion of black particles. And he, he veered, and I realized what happened is he got so close that the camera impacted the front of the car, blew into a billion pieces. And I'm like, my God, if that hadn't been doggy cam, if that had been speed rail, it would have twisted him up under the car and he would have been dead. And I'm just like, son of a bitch. And, 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 and the, the line producer who, you know, thank God is still a good friend today, but he was so mad, understandably, that that camera was destroyed. And he's like, Brad, you destroyed a camera. And I'm like, I'm like, I'm like, Mike, I, it was rigged where it was supposed to be. It was rigged appropriately. And that dude just did not time his move. He did not gauge his distance. And I just, you know, I hate, I hate, you know, making excuses, but I'm like, I had no control at that point. And, you know, thank God it was rigged safely so that it fell apart instead of taking him under the car. Um, so, yeah, that was probably one of the scariest because in that moment I was like, my God, you know, what happened? And is that dude going to die? How long did it take you to get over to where that you saw him get smaller and smaller? I don't even remember. <laughs> I don't even know if I went over there. I, I probably did, but it's like that, that's the only part of it I remember is like son of a bitch, and I and and I just remember that thing blowing into all those. I just I wouldn't have thought a camera could do that. You know, it just shattered. What does having a California Christmas reaching number one on Netflix mean to you? That's an interesting interesting question that that I have I have actually wrestled with because. It was absolutely unexpected, and I, I really, really was in shock. And, and I was gratified, and I was grateful, and I was so happy to be part of that special holiday season for people, and I was so happy to hear how much they enjoyed it. Um, I've had a lot of success in my life, and I've always kind of had this illusion that there would be a turning point, you know, where I would have this big moment and, and things would, would evolve in just this amazingly positive and prosperous way. You know, like when I won the VMA for Moby or when Brittany blew up or, you know, when Cook County was in theaters, you know, I've had these moments and, and invariably, you know, I've, I've not, had the expected results and I've, I feel like I've been disappointed. Um, and I always kind of, you know, felt like, oh, this is my moment to level up, you know? And, um, I mean, obviously I have leveled up because, you know, I'm doing cooler stuff now than I was then, but, but, you know, we all have ambitions to be beyond where we are. And, and I've just never fulfilled my hope for that. And, um, so when, when the movie came out, a lot of people were conflating its success with mine. And they were saying, oh, you must be so happy. You're going to do so well. You're so lucky. Blah, 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 blah. And I'm thinking, well, first of all, I have no profit participation in this movie. I got a flat salary and I will never see another penny from it. Um, but the other thing is I really, I got to the point where I got like really uncomfortable, like really emotionally uncomfortable. And I was thinking that, you know, what this is, is that I just, I, I am a very humble person and I'm uncomfortable with compliments and attention and the spotlight, you know, but I'm still gonna be grateful and appreciative. You know, I used, I had, I had this girlfriend once because I was uncomfortable with compliments tell me, you know, just shut up and let them say nice things, you know, and let, let them feel good. Don't, don't, you know, because I'd be like, oh, no, it's not true. And it's like, well, she said, that's not polite. That's not nice. But anyway, so I let them have their moment. But this dissonance really bothered me. And, and then I, I kind of realized later on that, that I was in my mind, I was like, I, I, I can't get my expectations up with this hyperbole. 
you know, this overwhelming hyperbole from all these people because, you know, to hear them say it, it's, you know, you know going to be all sunshine and rainbows and, you know, limousines and award shows. And I'm just like, that's probably not going to happen. And I, I can't let myself buy into that because, because it's, it's, it's the come down is really hurtful, and and the higher the expectation, the worse the come down. Now I'm not saying good things aren't going to happen. I mean, good things already have happened, you know. But 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 what I don't want is that is to get my head so up in the clouds, um, because those good things will happen regardless of of my expectation for them. Um, and I just don't want to have that disappointment. I would rather be pleasantly surprised by oh that's nice you know, than, than thinking and hoping, and, and then it's just not realized. So it was, it was, a, it was a complicated experience, and, and I tried to always be present to be grateful and appreciate the moment. And um, somebody said to me, well, it was a shame you couldn't enjoy that. And I said, I said well, I, I did in the sense that, you know, uh, again, I consider myself an artist, and I created something nice, and people appreciated it. And, and that's enough, you know? I just have to know that that's enough. That's, you know, just like I told you earlier, what was my contract with myself? My contract was that I would be an artist and anything beyond that is a bonus. And, and if I remind myself of that and I keep myself grounded in that and I know that people appreciate it and, and I look at that enthusiasm and hyperbole as an, an expression of their experience then then it's it's very it's still gratifying i'm i'm humbled i'm glad i mean it's you know we don't all our projects don't mean that much to people and it's nice you know i mean it's nice if i create something and it, it's meaningful to me you know like those those guys who did all those bugs bunny cartoons you know the chuck jones he said um you know we weren't trying to make them for kids you know we made them for ourselves and they found an audience on Saturday mornings and people thought they were kids shows, you know, and same thing with this. I mean, when I'm behind the camera, I'm, I'm not thinking about you or those Netflix viewers. I'm like, what do I like? I mean, what make, what do I think is pretty? And, and I believe that the director and the producers and Netflix, you know, are trusting my aesthetic because I've demonstrated it. And, and so I'm just doing that aesthetic. I mean, if somebody specifically said, oh, I want a hair light or I want this shadow, I would create that. But one of the things I do take as a compliment is, is I very seldom have people tell me to change stuff. You know, I just do what I want. I do what feels right and then they're happy. Um, so that's, that's, you know, my experience with the movie, maybe a little more complicated than you were expecting. No, it's really interesting. You know, someone once told me this advice in relation to something similar, what goes up must come down. Yeah. And I never, and it was so weird because I was literally thinking about that last night. So maybe I was, yeah. I don't know, it's just weird. But there's a lot to that. And that's not to negate good things happening. Yeah. But knowing that at some point yeah. it will come down and to not be devastated by that. Well, and the higher you go, the further you have to fall. I really was cognizant of that. I was like, oh my God, you know, this is huge. And if I write it, it's, oh my God, I'm just gonna be shattered. <laughs> so I just, I didn't emotionally, again, I just, I reconnected with the reason I did it. I didn't, I didn't do it for accolades. I mean, it would be nice strategically if, if somebody wants to hire me for something and I get some really cool jobs and clients because again, that's just more creative gratification and working with cool people and doing nice things that hopefully people will enjoy, you know? But it's a, it's a means to an end. The, the, the adulation in and of itself is uncomfortable to me. How did you find out that the film was number one on Netflix? I think Sean texted me, the director. Um, it was either that or I saw a Facebook or an Instagram post, but I, I'm pretty sure he texted me. We were all in shock. I mean, look, we knew it was a, a fun little movie, but it was a little movie. It was a little, you know, cute little thing that we did. And it's, all of us have been involved in, in stuff that going into it seemed like a bigger project, if that makes sense. You know, we just thought this was a little bitty sweet Christmas movie. Um, and, you know, the fact that it just, 
I mean, my God, it was number one in the world for eight days. I was looking at individual countries. I had friends in France and the Philippines and Canada and um, England and Wales and uh, Colombia and, and Brazil. And they're like, oh my God, we, we saw your movie. We love your movie. I'm just like, oh, wow, you know? I've never had that. I've never had a simultaneous global release ever. Never. Um, I mean, maybe those music videos, but that was 15 years ago and the internet didn't exist in the same way it does now. It's just, it's just, oh my God. I just like all these people talking about it and loving it and wishing me well. And I mean, somebody in the Philippines, somebody in Russia is watching my movie and, and, um, and they're liking it. And it's like, well, you know, you can't, you really can't hope for more than that. I mean, I was looking at those, those charts and we were above both Grinch movies. We were above Jim Carrey. We were above the animated Grinch movie. We were above like literally all this other stuff. When I looked at the, at the rate rankings, California Christmas was number 13 for the entire year of 2020 over all other genres of movies. And that's only more incredible when you consider it was only in release for two weeks, a 26th of the year. And it was number 13, that our little teeny tiny movie over all the George Clooney's and Jennifer Aniston's and, you know, wow, you know, that's cool. And I'm, and I'm glad I'm, again, I more than, more than getting full of myself, I'm glad people enjoyed it. I'm glad that it was a part of their Christmas, especially now when so many people are having a hard time. I'm glad that it was a distraction. I'm glad it made them smile. I'm going to read the first page of a California Christmas. And as a cinematographer, maybe you can interject and tell me what you think of different parts that I'm reading. Uh, exterior, Northern California skyline, morning. Uh, in a soft glide through a cluster of clouds, we ascend above multiple wine vineyards and rolling hills until San Francisco's skyline emerges in front of us. So I knew as soon as I read that, that was stock footage. I mean, I knew the scope of our of our film and and I knew that our only aerial would be, would be with a drone that couldn't get that kind of altitude and distance. And the funny thing is, is, is more than a few people have, have emailed me and they're compliment is, oh my God, I just loved those aerial shots of San Francisco and the, and the Bay Bridge. And I'm like, well, thank you. I will pass those compliments along to the stock footage company, which, you know, they always take in good humor. But, um, but yeah, funny anecdote. They wondered how you got those. I don't, those... Think, they, I don't think they wondered, they trusted, but I had to, I had to, Pretty... I had to tell them that, well, that's the dream, but it's only a dream. <laughs> because you would have had to do it with, I mean. It would have been a helicopter. A helicopter, right. A I drone know. at that altitude. Well, would a, drone, that... a drone won't rise to that altitude and you couldn't get that kind of distance with it. You know, it's not going to fly into the, over the bay and into the city. Right. Okay. Yeah. Because that's a, have you been on that bridge? Did you drive over that? I'm it's sure terrifying. I've been to San Francisco many times, but terrifying. I don't specifically. <laughs> Someone is afraid of heights. Okay. Well, in a car, <laughs> I don't, I only care when there's nothing between me and, and the, and the drop. Ah, if I'm okay. in a car or a helicopter, or I don't, you know, even if there's a high railing, I'm fine. We soar over the Golden Gate Bridge until we arrive at an upscale building. Interior Van Aston Hotel Suite Bedroom Morning. Sunlight pours into a beautiful high-rise hotel suite as Joseph Van Aston, 25, attractive with egotistical confidence, enters the bedroom from the bathroom wearing only a towel. So, so when I, I, I heard that, I mean, I felt it was a penthouse kind of thing, which, which would have been challenging because, you know, when it's a, when it's a penthouse, I mean, uh, unless you've got the money to, to, you know, lower a scaffold outside the, the building, you can't light from outside. Um, fortunately, we, we landed in, in this really cool um, structure, which was part of a hotel. It was a, it was a banquet area in a hotel that um, we treated as a bedroom. And it was, not only was it not a high level, it was actually slightly submerged, but there was this really nice high window that you actually see in the movie. And um, 
that was, you know, I have these wonderful lights called M18s, which are uh, uh, these lovely HMIs. I mean, they're just such a go-to HMI. And, and I, I put one out the window and um, that was a scene we didn't have a lot of time for because they wanted us out of the hotel. We, we had somewhere else to be. Originally, I was gonna do two HMIs out that window and we just didn't have time. We just, we just did the one and fortunately it works perfectly. I mean, I, looking at it, I am like, I don't even know why I would have wanted the second one. And really, I would have used it to create more depth, but the director didn't want the, the camera there anyway. So uh, it all just worked out fine, but... Uh, yeah, I put that I put that light in there and it was, you know, pretty hot and spicy and I was a little bit worried that maybe it was too hot. Um, we modulated it some um, and, you know, then in the end, I've had some people say that that's one of their favorite scenes. He throws open the closet door, walks in. Interior Van Assen Hotel Suite, walk-in closet, morning. Joseph grabs an expensive suit off of the rack and rips the tags off of it. The towel drops to the ground around his feet. When I heard that, I figured, you know, um, closet, we're probably gonna have to build a little piece of a set because, you know, any real closet, you're not gonna get the camera far enough away from him to get behind the, the clothes. I guess if you had a big walk-in, you could pull back and just set some clothes in the foreground. Um, but for whatever reason, I was thinking that, you know, we would have to build that. And, and as it worked out, again, it was a banquet room. And that door that he goes through is actually, it just goes back to a prep area where all, there are all these trays and, and um, you know, metal things and, and, and racks and crap. And we just cleared out a space and, and um, we shot a little corner, but it's actually a really big, big, like if you turned around, there's just, you know, tons of room filled up with junk. Um, and then we, we, you know, we pulled the camera back and, and we stole one of the wardrobe department's rolling, um, you know, uh, wardrobe hangers and we just stuck it in there. And, uh, but, but again, we had to shoot it really, really quick. And that was one of those things where like with his feet and the, uh, the uh, towel dropping, I mean, literally, I was just trying to get it in place and like, roll, roll, roll. It's like, oh my God, you know? So we didn't get a, I mean, it, the shot looks fine, but I didn't get a finesse it. It was just kind of like whatever the lighting was by the time I got the camera down there because they're like, shoot it, let's get out of here, we gotta go. Interior Van Aston Hotel Suite bedroom morning. Joseph steps out of the closet fully dressed in his suit. He looks fantastic. Then he looks at his phone with a cringe. Insert phone, Gemma, three missed calls. I think they ended up cutting that out. I don't think they've got the Gemma stuff. Oh, I see. Okay. All right. Well, well. No, I mean, I'm just saying, I, I, I don't, I don't even know if, I don't even remember if we shot that. Okay. I'm trying to remember. I thought he had some kind of a phone, but. Well, he has it when he talks to his mom, but does he have it in this scene? Maybe he does. Oh, uh, I'm not sure because he's dealing with this, this gal that's in his bed. Yeah. I know so. a chunk of this scene was cut out and I'm trying to remember which piece it was. I think it was the stuff in the closet. It's either cut out or it's truncated. Oh, okay. Well, here we have Jasmine O.C. in a sing-song voice. Joey! Joseph looks up from his phone to the bed. There is the gorgeous Jasmine, 20s, naked, in the bed, just waking up. Before she can speak, Joseph grabs a room service menu and brings it over to the bed. I remember, I remember when I read that, I was like, what's this naked stuff? Because I'm thinking <laughs> a Christmas movie. I, I don't know. Um, it's California. I, I Come on. Well, you know, Lauren wrote it, and, and I think that girl is a friend of theirs, so I, who knows? But, I mean, she was wearing a, what do you call it, a, a camisole, uh, so she wasn't naked. Um, okay. But, uh, you know, that was, that, was, that was funny. I remember, I remember thinking, oh, my gosh. You know, because anytime you do nudity, it's like there's some sensitivity and clear the set, and, and that's all good, but it slows things down, you know, because you have to clear the set. And I'm just thinking, well, that's going to complicate stuff. But, you know, in the end, like I said, I think she had a camisole on and we just did the, you know, the, the blanket in a quasi suggestive way. And, and, and there you go. And, and I think that, you know, I really like the way that that, that sun looks, that the, that the light looks. And it's, it's so funny because I think when I really get it right, you know, it feels like I didn't do it. And I'm just looking at it going, wow, that looks cool. I wonder who did that. You know, I don't, I don't feel the ownership of it when it when it really just 
you know, goes straight down the track like that. And, and you know, the, the flare in his, in his face, which is a little of a, a stylistic non sequitur because I don't think we have a lot of other flares, but it just worked so well in that scene and it was so beautiful. And, and maybe if I'm being honest, it's a, a tiny bit gratuitous, but I think everybody liked it and I think it's pretty. So there you go. Joseph handing the menu breakfast. Breakfast is on me. Checkouts at noon. She grabs the lapel of the suit jacket and holds him close. Joseph denies her kiss with a smile. He hovers. I have to say, I have to say he played that so much better than I pictured it in my mind. Oh, I just love the way he played that scene. And but the coverage and it really turned out a lot the way I pictured it in my mind when I read it. I mean, I felt that it really you know, because things are, don't always do that. I mean, sometimes you you picture it one way, and then you get there, and the location's different, or the actors play it different, or the act, you know the director wants to cover it different, and it's not quite what you picture. But I that that scene really did play out kind of the way that I imagined. You know, apart from the fact that that his the way he did that that kiss avoidance was just so so much better than what I imagined it would be. Right, and she says Joseph continued soft. I'll call you. Jasmine makes a pouty face. And I think if I remember correctly, she says, no, you won't. Yeah. Yeah, that was perfect. Yeah. Okay. That was an interesting, it was an interesting way to to introduce Joseph. And it was it was wonderfully succinct. I mean, you you said a lot, you said a lot in that that little tiny scene to just to set up what kind of a playboy and cad he was. And and I think that that made his um, transition more meaningful, you know, when you saw that he actually was falling in love with this, you know, tough country girl. Right. Who came from two separate worlds, yeah. you know. Mm -hmm. He was used to always hearing yes. She yeah. was probably always used to hearing no. She wasn't taking any shit from him. <laughs> <laughs> Brad, can you take us through how you lit certain scenes for A California Christmas? We have this one here where Lauren is on the phone. Yeah, that's a scene in in Callie's bedroom. I, I remember it's, a, it's on the second floor. And when Sean said he wanted to shoot in that bedroom, I was like, okay, I'm gonna have to get an extra high stand. So we got a, we specifically ordered an Avenger stand for this shot. And then also there's a scene in mom's uh, bedroom where she's sick and she's bed bound. That one also, we needed that Avenger stand because a normal stand would not get us up to an altitude where we could get a, a good angle, like we'd be pointing up. So, so that's a special stand. We shot it in the day with uh, an M18, which is the 1800 watt uh, HMI PAR. I remember in that moment worrying that there was a little too much glare. And uh, even when we did the color grade, I was like, Sean, you wanna you know, make that go away a little bit? He's like, oh no, I love it, you know? And he was right, it's, 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 it's beautiful. Um, but I'm just, it's, glare is just one of those things, um, you know, just like a flare, uh, you know, it, it, it can be aesthetically pleasing or it could be, uh, you know, an obnoxious artifact and, and it's just a fine line. And it's, it's really nice in, in this scene. That was one thing I, I thought about. And, but this is a very simply lit scene. I mean, it was, uh, I think we may have put some uh, negative fill behind the camera, you know, put some black up just to put a little bit of contrast in it because that light was bouncing off of those white walls. But um, not a lot, not a lot going on there. We just kept it simple and, and let that window do its thing. We also, we, we pick her up with a camera move that a pan that we pick her up coming in the door and then we follow her over to where she's standing in front of that window. So that's a, a nice transition too. And I think that was the only shot we did. I, don't know if we did two sizes of that. If we did, it was only two sizes. Not a lot of coverage. That was one of those scenes we shot simple and quick and, and she just, you know, she just nailed it, so. Here we have the barn scene. Yeah, I remember when we were scouting this angle and Sean saw that, I mean, behind us is, is kind of just a blind little cubicle, almost like a stall, but it wasn't enclosed. So I'm not really sure what its purpose was. And then to the left was um, uh, a little area with some machinery that was kind of, uh, I guess, because it's a dairy farm, I, I don't know, maybe they milk the cows and pump it into that stuff. But 
I don't know if it ended up in the movie, but that shot is actually, uh, it was on some, uh, it was on a Dana dolly on speed rails. So when we came to it, we just started pushing in, pushing in, pushing in. Um, and I'm not sure if they used that push in or if they cut in after we stopped. Um, and it's always tricky when you're in the shade with something bright outside. You're always kind of worried that you don't wanna underexpose this and then you don't wanna overexpose that and clip it. So it's a matter of you know finding that balance and then also maybe bringing up the inside a little bit. And so the rim light on that was coming from an M18, again, that HMI PAR. Uh, and I don't believe there was any diffusion. It was probably just clean and hard. Um, and uh, that was just coming from, from off camera to put that rim on him. And then I had a, 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 an Aries Sky panel you know, back up against the wall, just putting a little bit of fill to lift it up. I shot it on a red helium, which has the capacity to shoot what they call HDRX, which theoretically extends the dynamic range because it, it shoots alternating images. It, it, it shoots actually 48 frames. And so one is one exposure and then the other is an offset exposure and then it alternates. And, and that offset, like if you stop it down two stops, it kind of extends your dynamic range by two stops. And then there's a process in post where you can bring that information back in. I don't think I used that here. I, I remember thinking I used it a little more than I actually did because when we got into the color grade, I, I don't know if we ever actually invoked that even though it was in some shots. Um, but again, it's, it's just one of those tricky things. And if I had shot that on film, I'd have been very nervous and I'd have had a spot meter in there just metering all those values. Um, but as it was, you know, I was just looking at the monitor. Um, you know, I've been shooting for so long exposing to monitors and I just trust that if it's a properly calibrated monitor and then I have a histogram or a waveform that I can see the values um, I've done it enough times that I just trust that process. Um, so I set the exposure where I wasn't losing any information. And what I may have done, I don't remember this specifically, but in something like that, is I might underexpose the foreground just a little bit, you know, just to, to pull those highlights down, just to ensure that they're not clipping, because I know in post, as long as I don't crush that those shadows, I can still bring them up a little bit. This is also, seems like another uh, outside the barn or around the barn shot. Yeah, this is a, that, that is a barn, but it's a different barn. But it's funny that you should say that because we had barn as a location in the script and they're like physically completely different places. <laughs> you know, one was like for the dairy cows and then this was more of a, a storage shed. And honestly, you know, uh, Cooper did, a, you know, Michael Cooper, our, our production designer, did a really good job of dressing it because uh, you know, from the outside, it looks like a barn, but you go inside, it just looks like a great big storage shed, you know? So he went in there and, and pitched that hay in there. It was kind of fortuitous because it was such a big space and I was like, my God, where am I gonna hide a light? You know, I mean, I'm gonna, I, I wanna put a backlight on him, but how am I gonna hide a light? And, and what I ended up deciding is kind of like the story I told you um, about the shoot where I put the tape on the light is I just shoved that light right back there in the shot and had them wrap it with black uh, duvetine. So it's there, the light's there, it's just dark and you can't, or the stand, you, it's dark and you can't see it. And then up above the frame is the light that's lighting them. When we shot the master scene, I think, I can't remember if this was supposed to be day or night, I can't remember, but when we shot the master, it was dusk. And so I had to match that. So this, by the time we shot this, it was night, it was pitch black. So there really wouldn't have been any frontal light on them at all. And what I did is I put a 12 by ultra bounce out in front of the door. And then I took one of the sky panels and I color matched it to the daylight by eye. Um, you know, because again, I've just done it so many times that I, I feel I have really good instincts matching the color and um, dimmed it way, 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 way down, you know, so it wasn't a lot of, so it wasn't super bright. In retrospect, after I shot it, I kind of wished I had made that backlight a little warmer, but you know, maybe that's noodling. You know, they say a work of art is never finished, it's just abandoned. And so, you know, I, it's probably perfect just like it is. And that was just me, you know, wanting to nudge it some more. Um, 
but it was very fortunate because it looks nice in this in this 50-52 shot. And I was thinking when I go in for coverage, am I gonna have to, you know, move that light around so that it's flattering? And and like so many scenes on this movie, we just didn't have a lot of time. And we, we went in for coverage and it looked pretty good. And the only thing I really did instead of moving the light is I would just angle them. I would cheat their position a little bit to make it a little bit more flattering. So the geometry of their position in that space changed from the master, but it's such a tiny cheat that the audience can't tell. And it was, like I said, it was just it made the light a little bit more flattering on their faces. We have the interior bar. Yeah, I, you know, I was scared to death to do this bar from the time I read it in the script. And I was like, you know, can I please have a pre-light day? or a half a pre-light day. And it's like, it's just, there was no way because it was a working bar and um, it was too far away from our location to send anybody off. So it was like, you're gonna have to do it on the day of. I have worked with RGB LED lights pretty regularly now for about three or four years, but I had never lit in a, a bar seen interior with them yet. And that was a lot of lights. And I'm just like, you know, in the old days, you'd be sticking stuff up there and sleeving it with gels. And then you'd have cables to run across the ceiling and tack up and hide. And then you'd drop them all down, you know, in a place that's like, where are we never gonna look? Or if we do look there now, we're gonna have to move it. So, you know, there was all of that, but we used the Astera Titans that are battery powered. So there was no cables at all. Because they were RGB LED, we could just dial in the color and boom, there it was, blue, no, no gelling, no nothing. And, and you know, our gaffer, uh, Callum Barris, had everything connected to an app on the phone so he could just, you know, change the brightness, uh, turn some of them off, um, you know, because in different angles we would turn them off just because we didn't want that spill. Um, and right now I'm talking about the blue lights, the cobalt blue lights, which I love that color. I love cobalt blue. And, and um, that was kind of an easy, easy color. The thing that worried me was I didn't know the, the, how long the batteries were gonna last. I'm thinking, my God, you know, we're gonna have to turn them off between takes. And then at lunch, you're gonna have to put them on charge. And he said, yeah, no, I, you, they'll, they'll last. And, and, and we never put them on charge. Oh, and he zip tied them in. That's the other thing is they found a way to zip tie them into the ceiling because and I don't even know what they fixed those zip ties to, but but I was I was also worried about how are you going to get them up there without you know grip crap that we see in the shot because you see shots where you see the ceiling you see those tubes, um, but you know they look they look natural they look like they belonged so I was very happy about that and and the batteries just lasted and lasted um, the red light in the back again was was kind of a happy accident because that was the backlight for Caitlin, who was on the stage playing the keyboard. And um, that was one of the rarer instances of using tungsten Fresnels. And I think those were either 300s or, or 150s that we, we popped back there, um, you know, hanging down from the ceiling. I think what they did is they, I think they put a pole cat up, you know, as a small area. So they put a little, uh, like a, uh, an extendable metal telescoping uh, pole cat uh, and then they just hung those off of there. And, and you do see them a couple of times and, and they look like, you know, little lights, but it's like, oh, they're stage lights, whatever. And we put the, the red gel and, and then it just motivated that from that direction. And so it was very natural in this shot to use it there. And then for the white light on their faces, again, I used the Astera Titans. Um, now I just, I set them down on the bar and I dimmed them down. And th this looks like a, production still, because in the movie that light's not as bright on their faces. And this is probably somebody snapped it while we were setting up. Um, but it's just so beautiful. And I really like uplight. I really like the quality of uplight, but you have to be careful with it, especially, you know, with women you wanna make look beautiful because uh, if you get the angle wrong, it's gonna look like a horror movie. You know, you have to find that, just that, that sweet spot. And, and again, there's no formula. It depends on the person's face. It depends on the actions with the face. Um, and with Lauren, what we did is we ended up pulling it just a little bit closer to Josh, you know, to make it look nice on her. But I just, I just, I, I just love it. And um, um, 
And then in, in the wider shots, uh, we didn't have it on the counter. I hit it just on the other side of the counter. So she still kind of had had that feeling of it. But when we went in for the close-ups and we wanted it to look beautiful, we pulled it out on the counter and we found that sweet spot. And then when we reversed for him, we did the same thing. We just pulled it a little bit away. And we did the same thing when we shot Ali Afshar for Leo because he, as you know, comes into this scene. And one of the things I was worried about, and if I'd have had time, I'd have fiddled with it, I was worried that the, that the light on that jukebox was too bright because it was kind of clipping out. And I have no control over that. I would have had to gel it, or I would have had to make my lights brighter. Um, and Sean said, you know, I'm fine with it, so we just let it go. Great, this is, uh, looks like the uh, Airbnb or the hotel that they're staying at. Yeah, so this, this shot is in the movie, it's a place that Leo rents to put up Manny, you know, because they want Manny to disappear for reasons that are revealed in the film. And that's the place that they're renting out. And I really, I love this, you know, because for one thing, uh, the firelight. Now, in this, the firelight is just natural firelight. But when I went in for coverage, again, I used the Astera Titans and I would use, I did the fire flicker effect on them. Um, because the fire is really not, once you get in there and you're filming, it's not bright enough to, to, to light the faces in a flattering way. Obviously for the wide shots, I had to uh, go with what, uh, we didn't have a CG budget to paint lights out and I had nowhere to hide them. So I just had to go with available light for those guys back there. Although, you know, now that I'm looking about it, there may be a tube hidden, hidden down on the other side of that fire pit. Uh, I guess I don't remember for sure, but, uh, Anyway, I just, I love the, the quality of those Titans when they were doing the firelight. This is one of my favorite scenes in the movie. And the other thing is the night lighting, the moonlighting on Josh and the, and the uh, yard, and then in the reverse on Connor's truck. You know, it's kind of hard to hit that sweet spot because, you know, some people tend to overlight night and I just gotta hate night moonlight that's too bright and just looks absolutely fake. And then on the other end of that spectrum is, is the moonlight that's just so bloody dark and it's like, you know, you can't see detail and you're struggling and that might work well in a horror movie, but I think in a romantic comedy Christmas movie, that's just not the place to go. Um, so, you know, I was very happy with the ratio here. I mean, it feels, you see Josh clearly, but it feels like he's dark. And, uh, and I love the, the color shift between the blue and the warm. I think it's just a really pretty frame and I was very satisfied with that. Here we have the breakfast table. The breakfast table, yes. So pretty sure this is one of the ones w w which was shot at night and we put a silk, or not a, yeah, maybe it was a silk. I think it was a frame of diffusion, like 250 or 216 that we threw up in that window behind there. And then you see a sliver through the door of the other room, which not only did we have to put diffusion in that window, but I had to punch more light just to glow the ambience in the room so that it felt like daylight because if it was just the window lit, the room was dark and it just, it, you could tell that something was wrong. So it took a little more time than you might think to get this right. And, and by the way, you know, we were talking about this scene earlier and I said we started shooting it in the daytime. So, so that ambient light wasn't a problem then in the other room. That was another thing that had to be added. The other thing about the, the diffusion, it wasn't on the window. It was backed away from the window because I have two M18s crossing coming through there with a little bit of backlight. So if I had put it up against the window, I would have lost that quality. Another thing is I'm pretty sure it was this scene. It's definitely the scene when Josh leaves. When Josh, when she grabs his hat, you forgot something. I put a couple of, of Astera Titans up on top of those cabinets because those cabinets did not go all the way to the ceiling. There was a like a, a, a ledge. And I put those Astera Titans up there just to give a little bit of backlight. Um, and this is one of those scenes that Sean likes to talk about because there were so many people and we had, because of the COVID re re regulations, you know, anytime we changed lights or moved the camera, they all had to be cleared out. So to, to make that simpler, the camera is actually outside that house. There's a sliding glass door and a back patio and the camera never got closer than to push right into that door. And it never got wider, it never got wide enough to see the frame. So there's a little bit of push on some of these shots. And then the other thing is because uh, the lights 
were outside the window, the guys could go and fiddle with them. And then those Astera Titans were on an app. So in terms of turning them on and off and adjusting the, the level, we did not have to go in the room. The only time we had to go in the room is when we went in for coverage and we popped the camera off the, the Dana Dolly and, and went inside and then they would have to clear out. And that's a lot of people to clear out and bring back in. And then the front light, you know, just to, to, just to create that ambience behind us um, out, the, out the sliding glass windows was a great big uh, 12 by ultra bounce uh, that was probably T-boned because it was, um, it was on a porch. So you wouldn't have gotten the 12 foot height. So you probably just T-boned it and, and did like, you know, eight feet, nine feet, whatever you could, and, um, and then popped a light into it. And I wanna say that light was probably um, a, 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 an airy sky panel. I don't remember clearly, but I only had two M18s. And if that's what's playing outside the front, then it had to be the, the airy sky panel creating that, that soft light. And this is another one of those scenes where I was a little bit nervous about that, that glare coming in that window. You know, I didn't want it to obscure, um, you know, Joseph's mom's face. Um, and, and so we were just, you know, kind of careful. We would dial the level down because I still wanted it to be kind of blown out, but I didn't want it to be so bright that, you know, it was, it was like fogging up her face. And again, it was one of the things that I, I worried about a little more than Sean did. And Sean's like, it's beautiful, go with it. So, <laughs> but that was, a, that was a fun scene. And we spent a lot of time, we, I, it feels like we spent a half a day in that, in that particular location because we had several different day scenes and we had a night scene and we had the, the masters and the close-ups. I'm sure that's not true. I'm sure we didn't spend a half day, but you know, probably at least a good three hours, you know, just in that particular space. And beautifully lit. Thank you. Well, this is a triumph because, um, you know, this was another instance where, just like the bar, my lights were going to be in the shot. And, and you know, I had to fight the urge because, you know, starting out, it's a cardinal sin to have a light in a shot. Um, and it's funny, I have to tell you a story. You know, I won MTV VMA Moon Man for the Moby We Are All Made of Stars video. And... Uh, there was one scene, you know, when we shot that where he has got this kind of, you know, long rock and roller hair and he's looking into a mirror and, and in the mirror, I didn't notice it when we shot it, but later on I realized in the mirror, there's this little red Fresnel lens. I saw a bloody light and I'm like, how did I miss that? You know? And, um, and it was red because it was gelled and I was just like, oh God, you know? And, uh, <laughs> when they announced on MTV that, that that video had won for best cinematography, guess what clip they played? It was like just like rubbing salt <laughs> into the wound, you know? Here's your award and here's your fuck up. Um, but anyway, nobody else ever knew or cared. And if they did, they're like, he did it on purpose. So I did it on purpose, everybody. Right, maybe you're mocking <clears throat> it, so. But go. anyway, in the in the wide tilt down in this scene, you see both of them, was just, man, I, Sean had to reassure me, it looks like party lights, I'm okay. Um, and um, But what I did is when we shot them, because you're looking right at the light source, even though they're red to the naked eye, they clipped out. And so these white, rectangles. And I asked um, Keith Roush, who did the color grade, I'm like, would you please create red rectangles and just track them so that at least the front looks red, which he did. So that's a fix that nobody would know, but I just thought they looked really crappy all blown out. They were really good at lighting the space, but and they were really bright, these bloody things but they were not so bright that they put the rim lights on Callie and Joseph. That is actually Astera Titans again on just on C stands with the red lights and cause they're at the far end of a barn. So I'm, I'm bringing those, those Astera Titans around to just get that sweet spot and, and do that red. And, and, you know, frankly, that was, that was all my idea. You know, I was just like, that's what I want to do. Um, and then we start this scene in reverse, it's daytime. And they come driving up on the golf cart and then they walk just inside the doors and this happens. Well, after we flipped around, the sun went down. So there was no front light. And I had to replicate this 
feeling of the glow coming in the door. And so the light on their face is not daylight. It's that same 12 by ultra bounce out the door with a light popped into it. And it certainly was not the uh, Airy Sky panels because both of them are playing. So it was, it was an M18 that was popped into that. And, and because it's so dim, um, uh, you know, it must have been scrimmed way down and probably even closed the doors some, um, you know, to waste some of the light just to create that quality. Um, and uh, so so that's that's what I did. And um, I liked it, but the the highest compliment of all is that is that one of Maria, uh, the still photographer's shots of this lighting setup is what, Netflix used for their th their thumbnail and their advertising and I'm like you know that's that's just you know you can't have a better compliment than that and um you know you, you did a good job of picking some of my favorite scenes there are, there are some others that I really like too but but these are all some of my favorite lighting um and you know like I was telling you earlier about how I love that this movie let me show off some different looks and different styles I mean if we hadn't had you know, the colors and the barns, if it was all in the house, you know, we, we could get dramatic with it, but it wouldn't, you know, you wouldn't have the color, you wouldn't have, you know, that really dramatic uh, range of, of different uh, flavors. And so um, that's another thing that I really appreciate this movie for, is it really let me, you know, have, have fun with a lot of different looks.